Good morning, welcome to Breakfast with me, John Kay, at the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh and Sally Nugent at Buckingham Palace. Our headlines today. The first stage of the Queen's final journey begins as her coffin is driven from Balmoral to Edinburgh before being flown to London on Tuesday. The Queen is due to lie in state for four days here in the capital before a state funeral at Westminster Abbey on Monday the 19th of September. Members of the royal family have thanked mourners who've gathered to remember the Queen, including an unexpected show of unity from Princes William and Harry. Good morning, it's Sunday the 11th of September. I'm at the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh, the official residence of the British monarch in Scotland. And the Queen's coffin will arrive here from Balmoral later today. Let's have a look now at the route that it will take. And at around 10 o'clock this morning, her coffin will be carried by six of the gamekeepers from her Scottish estate, from the ballroom at Balmoral to a waiting hearse. And from there, it will begin a six hour, 175 mile journey. And that route will pass through Aberdeen, then on through Dundee, before finally arriving at the palace here, where it will lie in the throne room until tomorrow afternoon, Monday afternoon. Well, they've been rehearsing for this ceremony throughout the night. We've heard drums uh, being beat uh, just in the last hour. We've seen marching parades uh, just in the last few minutes. And our correspondent, Judith Morris, has this uh, report on what we can expect in the days ahead. The eyes of the world are about to turn to Edinburgh. And step by step, beat by beat, the pageantry must be perfect. In this city, no one wants to put a foot wrong. This was yesterday's dress rehearsal. Today will be the real thing. Those with ceremonial responsibilities are feeling a mixture of pressure and pride. It's a huge responsibility. I have been the Lord Provost and the Lord Lieutenant for just a few weeks, and I just hope I live up to the expectations of me, and I hope, and I'm sure that the city will put on a, a very determined show of its respect for the Queen in the next few days. Three cheers for His Majesty the King! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Yesterday, the public proclamation of the new king at St James's Palace in London began a series of historic ceremonies. I am deeply aware of this great inheritance and of the duties and heavy responsibilities of sovereignty which have now passed to me. In taking up these responsibilities, I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set in upholding constitutional government and to seek the peace, harmony and prosperity of the peoples of these islands. But as well as the formal events, there were also moments for family. At Windsor, William and Catherine, together with Harry and Meghan, came to meet well-wishers and share memories of their grandmother, the Queen. And at Balmoral, Princes Andrew and Edward, Princess Anne, their spouses and children, read some of the many tributes, which prompted obvious emotions and a tender moment as Princess Eugenie held on to her father for comfort. Today, the focus will move from the monarch's summer residence to the Scottish capital. Because the Queen died at Balmoral, it set in train a whole sequence of events in Scotland that wouldn't have happened had she passed away in London. And so its capital city is readying itself as the Queen's coffin is brought here and Edinburgh becomes the centre of events for the next few days. On Monday, the King will join the procession as the coffin is brought along the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral, where the Queen will lie at rest. 
anybody can talk about faith, but to live it is what makes a difference to people. And I think she lived it, and she lived it in the way... Reverend Liz Henderson is one of the royal chaplains and is preparing for the service of prayer and reflection to be held at the cathedral. When you look around Edinburgh, you can see that building, can't you? The, the place is getting busier and busier and there are more people gathering and they are particularly in this part of the old town. And so the focus is very much on St Giles. It has particular significance um, for this service because the Queen actually came here just three weeks after her coronation in June 1953. And it was here that she was blessed by the then moderator of the Church of Scotland and the Dean of the Chapel Royal. As flowers continue to arrive, news crews keep coming too. Demain matin, à 11h heure française, le château de Balmoral pour rejoindre le palais d'Hollywood. Here, from all over the globe. French people are fascinated by the royal family, by all the stories. Uh, they don't want monarchy in France, but uh, they are very attached by the royal family. When we learned uh, when we were on set in Paris that something uh, was about to happen, we were all very sad. We were all very sad. I come from Italy, from Rome, and the minute we heard the news that the Queen was sick, we just flew to Great Britain and then we moved to Balmora because it's of a huge impact in Italy as well. We, we're very interested into British monarchy. Yesterday we had half an hour of, um, dedicated to this, uh, to this event and we're going to keep, keep going on for the next few days until the official funeral. Amongst the pomp and protocol, there are the people, once the Queen's subjects, now the King's all witnessing history as it happens around them. Judith Moritz, BBC News, Edinburgh. Well, the Lord Provost uh, telling Judith in that piece about that sense of expectation uh, that he feels himself, but you feel that sense of expectation just on the streets of this city uh, growing over the last couple of days. And even overnight, we've seen uh, the rehearsals continuing uh, hundreds of soldiers out on the Royal Mile preparing, as Judith was just saying, uh, for those ceremonies that we will see in the next couple of days. The coffin of Queen Elizabeth II will be brought here to the Palace of Holyrood House this afternoon from Balmoral, and then tomorrow afternoon will be taken from the Palace here up the Royal Mile in a procession to St Giles's Cathedral. And so that is why these rehearsals that you're seeing at the moment, these pictures of rehearsals overnight, are taking place minute by minute to block out and choreograph every moment. There is a determination here among everybody, the people of the city, those involved in the ceremonials, to get everything completely perfect. Well, our correspondent, Sarah Campbell is at Balmoral Castle for us this morning, where the Queen will leave uh, a little bit later today, uh, a place that she loved so much. And Sarah, we've seen the crowds gathering there at the gates over the last couple of days. One can only imagine the numbers that we'll see today. Yes, good morning to you, John. Um, this is such a, a beautiful part of the world um, and it seems in contrast to some of the pictures that I've seen from elsewhere of Buckingham Palace and other royal residences. Over the past three days there has been such an air of tranquility here, such peace I'm here and the only sound really that I can hear is the sound of the River Dee which is just 100 metres or so um, from where I am and it's not difficult at all to see why the Queen loved it here so much. It is beautiful. The glens, the scenery, the 50,000 acre estate that she was able to wander around, to be with her family, to be of course with her husband, Prince Philip. She spent so many long, happy summers here over her life. 
Uh, and yesterday, her family, who've been gathering here over the last three days since her death on Thursday, they left through the gates of Balmoral. They made the short journey to Crathy Kirk, which is nearby here for a short private service. And then they came back and they walked along the crowds. They got out of their vehicle, walked along, shook hands very briefly with the crowds that had come to lay tributes for their mother and grandmother. And they spent some time looking at those tributes, reading some of those very heartfelt mess messages. Of course, you'll remember that the Queen was seen as part of the community here. So many of those messages are very personal from people who met her, who would have bumped into her in the local shops. So I think a really moving moment, you could see it on their faces. You could see that members of the royal family were comforting each other. And as they went back into Balmoral, they turned around, they gave the crowd a wave and the crowd waved back and applauded. And it was a real moment, I think, of the royal family acknowledging and giving thanks for the people coming to see them and the, and the crowd acknowledging back that they were all experiencing this sense of loss uh, of the Queen. If I just take you through what we're expecting today, we now know that since Thursday the Queen has lain in an oak coffin in the ballroom here at Balmoral. A coffin has been adorned with the Royal Standard of Scotland and a wreath of flowers. And the time that it's been here has been important, obviously, for the family to pay their respects, but also for the members of her loyal staff, many of whom have worked with the Queen for years and years and really devoted their lives to her. So they have been able to have some quiet time with, here, uh, with her here at Balmoral. And at 10 o'clock, um, uh, six gamekeepers will take the coffin to a waiting hearse and then it will leave through those gates and John I think that for many of us me included there have been moments over the last three days where it's felt slightly surreal can this really have happened and I think for many people that reality will really be made clear when they see the first picture of that coffin leaving the gates as she starts that long journey first to Edinburgh and then finally to her final resting place in Windsor. Indeed. Sarah, thank you. I think, I think that's right. I think it is that site that will make people confront and, and accept what has happened. And I think just even seeing the rehearsals here in the last hour sort of reinforces that as well about the reality of what we will see in the couple of days ahead of us. Sarah there describing the, the peace and tranquility of Balmoral, which the Queen loved, which is now providing uh, peace and tranquility to her children as they grieve. But of course, the focus in turn will head to London, where crowds have gathered in their thousands over the last couple of days. That's where the state funeral will be a week tomorrow. And Sally is at Buckingham Palace for us this morning. Hi, Sally. Thanks very much indeed, John. Good morning. Yes, it's a misty morning over Buckingham Palace here in London this morning. And I don't know if you can make out behind me, actually, Security guards are putting out more barriers, more barricades, because many more people are expected to come here today. And I don't know if you can just make out at the gates, there are several candles that have been left out overnight, people coming to pay their respects and take a moment here. All the flowers actually have been taken away. So the floral tributes, the candles and the children's drawings of Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, are now being moved to a nearby park. And as you can see, the stage is now set for another day Another moment to people, for people to come here and to remember and to spend some time. Well, our correspondent Tim Moffat has been speaking to people about how the death of the Queen has affected them. Step by step, we are all readjusting to life in a new era. It's just a very strange, solemn time losing someone that's been there all of your life. Southwark Cathedral in London. Rarely has queuing, that mundane, archetypal British activity, felt so poignant. Books are being filled with messages of condolence. The Queen's been our Queen for all our lives, and uh, I think now 
we have a king and it's likely to be kings for all the rest of our lives but our children's lives as well it's momentous What did you decide to put? Um, I put the stories and what you did for our nation will never leave us. And I think that's what's really come, come across, is the fact that we, we didn't really know what she meant and what she did until she's not there. Football matches have been called off this weekend, and on the Thames, so too was the Great River Race, typically competitive and gruelling. Instead, the more than 300 participants were invited to be part of the Queen Elizabeth II Memorial River Procession. As soon as the death of Queen Elizabeth was announced on Thursday, thousands of bouquets of flowers were laid in front of Buckingham Palace. Now, in London, well-wishers are being asked instead to place them in Hyde Park or here in Green Park. Have you been surprised as to how you've reacted? Some people say I that. was very surprised. Yes. And I don't know why, I felt very teary. Maybe as a mother of a daughter, she led with such dignity, and I often try and teach my children humility and dignity, and she was a perfect example, so I think uh, that's why it's shaken me a bit. Audrey Stevenson was in the Royal Navy for almost 30 years and met the Queen several times. Um, I needed to come and pay my respects and uh, it's just really affected me deeply, the loss of the, uh, our Queen. Um, I served in the military for 27 years and uh, the day I joined the military was the day that I swore allegiance to the Queen um, and I, I joined up to serve her and I was proud to do so. When you, when you spoke to her you didn't, you didn't feel nervous, you just felt this calmness come around you because she was just so graceful. I feel like I've lost my grandmother. I feel so humbled by how the whole country has reacted, the nation, the world, everybody. Um, and we just felt it was the right thing to do, just to come down and pay our respects. It has brought uh, memories to my mum as well. I have, she's passed away and it's just brought a lot of memories and just remembrance of it, because my mum adored the Queen. We were blessed to have her. This national period of reflection has for many led to unexpected emotions, feelings and memories. The impact of Queen Elizabeth II's extraordinary life continues to be felt. Tim Muffet, BBC News. Tim there with the stories of people who have travelled to London, to Buckingham Palace to spend some time here and I don't know if you will be able to make out just behind me there's a little bit of noise going on at the moment as they rearrange the barriers here to basically change the layout of how people can come and spend their time here at Buckingham Palace should they choose to do so today. Of course many, many people expected here today, Sunday, to come and take a moment at Buckingham Palace. Lay some flowers, as we mentioned the flowers are actually being moved away to a nearby park at the moment but many more people expected to be here in London today. And our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams, is at Clarence House for us this morning, where the new king is preparing for events here at Buckingham Palace. Morning to you, Paul. And what is on the agenda for the new king today? Yeah, good morning, Sally. The, the king's third day as king, um, and the first since yesterday's proclamation. Uh, he's still living here at Clarence House, just a short distance from where you are, no more than a couple of hundred yards from Buckingham Palace. This has been his official residence for some time, and we don't yet know when he and his wife, the Queen Consort, intend to move out of here and perhaps into the palace. Uh, while attention very much focuses on events in Scotland today, for King Charles, it's all about getting on with establishing himself as the new monarch. Uh, Yesterday he got to meet the cabinet. Today he'll be meeting uh, the uh, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Baroness Scotland, and after that there'll be a reception down there in Buckingham Palace, the office if you like, with uh, representatives of the 14 countries that still recognise uh, the King as their head of state. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Jamaica and others. King Charles has made several references in speeches already to his 
fervent desire to uphold his mother's legacy when it comes to the Commonwealth. Queen Elizabeth very much associated with building the reputation of the Commonwealth, binding these countries together all across the world. King Charles has said he's determined to continue that legacy. In 2018, Commonwealth leaders agreed that he would indeed continue to be the head of the Commonwealth. He may face, as king, uh, discussions in some of those countries about their future relationship with him and with the United Kingdom. Last year, Barbados decided to become a republic. He may well have those conversations again in the future, but not today. Today is all about telling those Commonwealth leaders that he intends to lead uh, the Commonwealth as fervently, as successfully as his mother did. Paul, thanks very much indeed. Well, it is, of course, a significant week for political leaders too, perhaps none more so than for the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who is actually going to be accompanying the King on his upcoming tour of the UK. Well, our political correspondent, Ione Wells, is in Westminster for us this morning. Morning, Ione. I mean, it has been quite a week for Liz Truss, hasn't it? That's right. This is a week that has felt like a lifetime. Just on Monday, we were at the Queen Elizabeth II Centre here in Westminster, where Liz Truss found out that she was going to be the next leader of the Conservative Party. On Tuesday, she was up visiting the Queen in Balmoral, where she was officially invited to form a government and officially became the new Prime Minister, one of the last acts of duty that the Queen performed. On Wednesday, we had a new government appointed. And on Thursday, I was in the House of Commons chamber just behind me, watching Liz Truss outline her first big policy announcement as Prime Minister, that plan to cap energy bills at £2,500 a year. When suddenly the news began to ripple through the chamber of MPs that there were serious concerns about the Queen's health. And in that moment, the sort of political divisions that had been thrashing out across the chamber suddenly subsided, really, as everybody's focus turned to paying their well wishes to the Queen and her family. And by that evening, when we received the tragic news of the Queen's death, the, government's, the governance of the UK changed instantly. We went from having Her Majesty's government to His Majesty's government. And in the subsequent couple of days, the new Prime Minister, her government, leaders of the opposition parties have met with the new King in audiences uh, with him in what would normally be very private conversations. But they have done so under the spotlight and the watch of the whole world, really, watching them. And that's going to continue into next week as well. After King Charles addresses MPs here in Westminster on Monday, he begins his tour of the UK, which Liz Truss will accompany him on, visiting Edinburgh, Belfast and Cardiff as well. Now, Liz Truss won't play a particularly significant role on these visits. She will be mostly attending church services, but they will carry a, a symbolic as well as perhaps a political value as the new head of state and the new head of government introduce themselves to the whole of the United Kingdom. And Ione, as you mentioned, it was interesting, wasn't it, that those first conversations were all recorded. It was another first, wasn't it? We were seeing a really quite private moment played out very publicly. That's right. This is the first time we've had television cameras document moments like this. And as you say, that first meeting between King Charles and Liz Truss, we had a little glimpse inside that for the first time. And as I say, these are normally incredibly private conversations. Former prime ministers have spoke spoken in the past about uh, the kind of comfort that that privacy has provided with Sir John Major telling us just the other day, for example, that only the Queen's corgis were ever privy to the kinds of conversations that he had with the Queen. We did get a glimpse, as I say, into that first meeting between Liz Truss and King Charles. Uh, and in that moment, uh, we saw King Charles turn to her and say that he's just got to try and keep things going. Uh, and I think that is the sentiment which both of them will be carrying around the UK on their visits next week. Ione, thanks very much indeed. That's Ione Wells reporting for us. Now, when King Charles III was Prince of Wales, he was a passionate campaigner for the environment, championing issues like climate change and river pollution before they were even fashionable. Now, our climate editor, Justin Rolat, has been looking at how his deeply held environmental beliefs will affect his role as monarch. It is 53 years since Prince Charles formally became Prince of Wales at a ceremony in Carnarvon Castle in 1969. I, Charles, Prince of Wales, do become your liege man of life and limb. 
He has been campaigning on environmental issues virtually ever since. This is the then Prince in 1970. We are faced at the moment with the horrifying effects of pollution in all its cancerous forms. Your Royal Highness, lovely to see you. His views have not changed. Uh, I've always felt that we're you know, over-exploiting and, and uh, damaging nature by not understanding how much we depend on everything that nature provides and also not understanding or having been somehow trained to believe that nature is a separate thing from us and we can just exploit uh, and control and suppress everything about her. Over the years, Charles became increasingly concerned about climate. He worked, often in the background, to try and mobilise action, particularly by businesses on the issue. Governments have billions of dollars, corporations have trillions, he'd say. Here's the King opening the International Conference on Climate in Glasgow last year. We need a vast military-style campaign to marshal the strength of the global private sector. So how will his views inform his reign? Charles is well aware of the risks. So let me ask you this. Is our government doing enough to make these things happen? I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> The new king has acknowledged his constitutional obligation to remain politically neutral, and his friends have no doubt he will stick to that. Everything we know about how he has thought about his accession the moment that he becomes king tells us that he will be absolutely clear about his constitutional duties. I know he will still want to share that set of concerns, that passion. But it'll be done very differently. It won't be done in the way that he was able to do it as the Prince of Wales. And few people would disagree with the new king's core belief that we fail to protect and preserve nature at our peril. But whether he'll choose to articulate that view in his new role remains to be seen. Justin Rowlatt, BBC News. Just in there with his thoughts on how the new king will continue to develop his interest in the environment in his new role. Well, it is exactly 27 minutes past six. Let's have a look now at how the weather is looking across the UK. His staff. Thank you. Good morning to you. Well, it's looking like being a drier part two of the weekend with more sunshine around today with high pressure continuing to dominate. But there will be some rain pushing into western areas later on. All could see this new area of low pressure. Some of the rain will be quite heavy for a time across Northern Ireland into this evening. But high pressure holds on across much of the country. Light winds, quite a chilly start today. Some early mist and fog, which will tend to lift and break. And then we should see quite a bit of sunshine around. Just a slim chance of an isolated light shower. Further west, though, it starts to turn cloudy, breezy and much wetter, certainly for Northern Ireland. Temperatures up to around 21 degrees, though, northern Scotland with the sunshine, up to 23 degrees across the southeast. But it turns very much wet across Northern Ireland, then into Scotland, Northern England, Northern and Western Wales this evening and overnight. Could have some rumbles of thunder with that rain, and behind it, some blustery showers pushing to the far northwest of Scotland, but dry and quite mild and muggy across the south. So for Monday then, we have a three-way split. Central areas will see that weather front rather damp with outbreaks of rain. To the north of it, it's cooler sunshine and some blustery showers in the northwest of Scotland. But southern Britain will be drier with some sunshine and feeling quite warm, up to 25 degrees there, maybe an odd heavy shower but fresher in the north. That fresher air in the north does spread southwards uh, as we move into Tuesday, maybe a few showers on it. And then high pressure builds into the west, so it'll be largely settled to the latter part of the week, but it will be turning cooler. Good morning. You're watching BBC Breakfast. I'm live this morning at the Palace of Holyrood House here in Edinburgh. And this is where the Queen's coffin will arrive later today from her beloved Balmoral estate. And there's a sense of calm here, really, just a few moments before sunrise on this Sunday morning. A sense of expectation, too, because this city is going to play a crucial role in the next couple of days in the ceremonial side of the preparations before the state funeral. Now, the, the Queen will lie in state here for 
uh, in for four days before her funeral in Westminster Abbey uh, on Monday. That'll be the 19th of September. And our diplomatic correspondent James Landell has been taking a look at what we can expect in the days ahead. At 10 o'clock, six of the Queen's gamekeepers will carry the coffin to a hearse that will drive slowly south, taking six hours to reach the palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh. The following afternoon, just after half past two, the coffin will travel in military procession along the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral, with the King and other members of the Royal Family following on foot. There, after a service involving people from all parts of Scottish society, the Queen's body will lie in rest for 24 hours to allow the public to pay their respects. There'll be a continuous vigil held by the Royal Company of Archers and, just after 7pm, by the King himself. On Tuesday afternoon, the coffin, accompanied by the Princess Royal, will be flown to Northolt Airport in London and taken on to Buckingham Palace. From there, on Wednesday afternoon, the Queen's coffin will leave the palace, conveyed up the mall by a gun carriage, the King and members of the royal family walking slowly and silently behind, with no music, just the tolling of Big Ben. Through Horse Guards, down Whitehall, the procession will end at Westminster Hall, where the Archbishop of Canterbury will conduct a short service. In this ancient building, the Queen will lie in state for four full days, her coffin mounted on a raised platform known as a catafalque, with many thousands expected to file past the coffin. And then, on Bank Holiday Monday morning, the Queen's coffin will leave Westminster Hall, and be taken in a grand military procession to Westminster Abbey. Members of the royal family are expected again to follow on foot. At 11 o'clock, the full state funeral will begin at the Abbey, where foreign statesmen, European royal families and other dignitaries will join the public in honouring the life of a queen who will be laid to rest later at St George's Chapel, Windsor. James Landale, BBC News. Well, before the Queen's coffin is taken to London. It will be brought here to Edinburgh to the Palace of Holyrood House, her official residence uh, here in Scotland from Balmoral. Um, we can see at the moment uh, that out there at the gates of the palace, uh, high security, uh, security guards, the police in attendance, uh, making sure that the whole area is safe and sealed. But it's not locked down. Barriers have gone up uh, to hold the crowds that are expected uh, later today as uh, the coffin arrives here and then tomorrow afternoon when the coffin is taken by procession from the palace up the Royal Mile to the Cathedral of St Giles, uh, just about a quarter of a mile up the Royal Mile. And we can see these pictures, these are rehearsals for the ceremony which have taken place just in the last hour or so. The military have been out on the streets of Edinburgh right through the night practicing for this moment. A moment that the Queen herself had been involved in the planning of. She, she was well aware of what was going to happen at every stage of these proceedings and what would happen if she passed away, as indeed she did, here in Scotland. So all of this follows a set procedure, a set choreography. But here in Scotland today, We'll see two proclamations in Edinburgh involving trumpeteers and civic dignitaries and the military, but of course also the public. Thousands of members of the public expected to turn out and see these scenes, these rehearsals, when they are for real later today and tomorrow. And of course, this being Edinburgh, you walk around these streets and you hear so many foreign accents and languages. There are already so many visitors here, always so many tourists here. And they are now caught up in, in what will be uh, an extraordinary event over the next couple of days. And talking to people on the streets last night and this morning, uh, so many of them intend to, to come here today and tomorrow to witness this moment in our history. But from Scotland in the next couple of days, uh, the attention will turn to London, to Buckingham Palace, and we can cross now to Sally, who is there. Morning, Sally. 
Morning, John. Thank you very much indeed. You join me as actually things are changing ever so slightly here at Buckingham Palace. The first few people have just started to arrive and spend a little bit of time outside the gates here. And actually what's happening is um, more space is being made for many thousands of people who are expected to come here today. So there is now a larger space in front of the palace for people to bring their tributes, which they've been doing over the last several days since the Queen's death was announced on Thursday. Well, yesterday, in a surprise show of unity, the new Prince and Princess of Wales and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex appeared together to greet well-wishers and look at the floral tributes outside Windsor Castle. Our royal correspondent, Daniela Ralph, has this report. Nobody had seen this coming. After the fallout and friction, it was unexpected and unannounced. Walking together through the Cambridge gates of Windsor Castle, the new Prince and Princess of Wales and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. It was a family reunited in grief. There were a few words exchanged as they looked at the flowers and tributes left to honour the Queen. All eyes were on them. The brothers have barely spoken to each other in two years, but something clearly shifted. Then to the crowds. Harry and Meghan down one side of Windsor's long walk, chatting, receiving flowers, and condolences. On the other side were William and Catherine, doing much the same, particularly with families and children who'd come out to remember the Queen. It's lovely to come together, isn't it, for their nan? They both obviously love their nan very much, don't they? Time of crisis, we all need to be together. Obviously, no family likes, you know, any conflict, don't fall out. No, well, obviously, we don't know what's going on, but it's great to see them together. And obviously, as well, it's good for the country as a whole. William, Prince of Wales, issued a moving, personal statement about his grandmother. He said, She was by my side at my happiest moments, and she was by my side during the saddest days of my life. I knew this day would come, but it will be some time before the reality of life without Granny will truly feel real. The fractured relationship between William and Harry has shown few signs of healing. After the funeral of their grandfather, the Duke of Edinburgh, there was hope that this chat would lead to a reconciliation. There was a similar hope when the brothers came together to unveil a statue of their mother, but the hurt was deep on both sides and neither could find a peace. As they walked back, there was a joint goodbye. Bye everyone, thank you so much. Thank you everyone. And then the royal couples left together in the same car. Who knows if this is a lasting reconciliation, but the loss of the Queen has gone some way to mending a damaging family rift. Daniela Ralph, BBC News. So those are the scenes in Windsor yesterday evening and the crowds that you see there have been at many significant places that are associated with the Queen up and down the UK. So many people have been sharing their memories of the Queen and what she meant to them. John Maguire has been meeting some of them over the last couple of days. John, I know you're not far away from where I am now. What is the mood like and what's everybody saying there this morning? Yeah, morning, Sally. As you say, our third day here in front of Buckingham Palace, which has been one of those focal points. Focal points right across the UK, of course, for people wanting to lay floral tributes, leave cards. We were just over in Green Park, which is behind us, because what's happening here at Buckingham Palace, the system started yesterday, is people that are turning up with floral tributes are being asked to take them to Green Park, which is just over there. And I must say, there's now an absolute sea of floral tributes there, but also written tributes as well uh, and lots and lots of books cards small teddies representing paddington it seems as if paddington has uh, become uh, a symbol of her majesty's reign of course because of that wonderful sketch that they did during the platinum jubilee celebrations just a few weeks ago months ago quiet this morning i must say but certainly if yesterday and the day before anything to go by there will be thousands upon thousands of people here and they're, they're, they're exercising crowd control and moving barriers around all of the time. We've gathered some of the uh, early birds who are here to, to, to catch the worms just to get a quiet moment before uh, the crowds arrive. Becky and Fiona, good morning to you. Good morning. From Norfolk, I know, but you were here anyway. Um, you've decided to get up early and beat the crowds. We did. We, um, we 
We wanted to come yesterday, but the crowd seemed to be so intense that we decided when we woke this morning, you know, let's just to come down and pay our respects. We were here for the Jubilee, and that was so wonderful. And about 10 years or so, my kids um, got the opportunity to give flowers to the Queen. I just ah, think this wow. is now my opportunity to do it. And is that something they're now old enough to, re to remember? Yeah, right. absolutely. And they look back on it really fondly. Do they? Do yeah. they? Um, and it, it's... Even when it's busy here, it's quiet, mm. strangely, but, but yes. quieter this morning. And, and yeah. the chance to reflect, maybe? What, what, what are your thoughts <clears throat> this morning? I just think, just reflecting back on just being part of our life forever, basically, and having an opportunity to come this morning and pay our respects and just quietly, you know, it's just, just a really good thing to do. And yeah, and you'll lay some flowers. Yes, absolutely. Um, yes. Thoughts behind the flowers? <laughs> to be quite honest, it was quite difficult okay. to get flowers <laughs> in London. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Possibly yeah. not as big an offering lots, as I would have known. Lots, lots and lots of sunflowers I keep yes. seeing. Yeah, yeah. Lots of sunflowers. Obviously it's the time yeah. of year. The Queen loves flowers and we just thought it was a nice thing yeah. to do. And just right. to Wonderful. Do Thank you very thank much you. for talking sure. to us this morning. Now, uh, Lauren and Alethea, good morning to you too. Good morning. From Port Talbot. Yes. Um, now, Alethea, you're a, a, a photographer. <laughs> Yes, I am. Just tell me the sort of the images that you've been looking out for over the last few days. Um, well, personally, I've been trying to go for more of like capturing the children's yes. aspect because it, it's such a profound time where the, in their life that they're not going to quite understand until they're older and trying to capture the innocence in them putting, laying flowers and offerings. It's just so beautiful and I think it's an aspect that really needs to be captured. And, Maybe if the fonters are available, they can look back and think, oh, look, that was me mm. back then. And yeah, so I think that's a really important aspect to capture. Because children will always remember the day they met yes, the Queen, definitely. as long as they were old enough in yes, the first place, or, or they'll remember being here. Mm -hmm. So that, there's some special memories for them if they're able to see it, isn't yes, it? Yes, definitely yeah. is. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And Lauren, you live in London now, I think, yes, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You said you've been here every day for the last few days. Yes, yes, so I came down as soon as the announcement came through um, on Thursday evening. Mm -hmm. I was here within like tw half an hour, and uh, I was actually one of the first ones to arrive at the gates, um, which was, you know, surreal, and then the crowds started you know um turning up then and i did feel like i was going to get crushed at one point and with the rain and everything so i did leave um a couple of hours later but yeah it was just wow everybody was here in such shock um and it's nice and quiet now this morning yesterday was quite busy as well um busy but still so quiet you know there's just this this strange atmosphere it's a difficult atmosphere but today now it's nice to come down this morning and see it a little bit quieter and you know we can pay our respects here um with, you know, in a lot more calmly. Yeah, it's easier to, to, to reflect in, it is. when, it, when it's yeah. a bit quieter, yeah. isn't yeah, it? Definitely. Thank you, great to see you as well. Uh, Vadit, good morning to you. Originally morning. from Israel, now live in the UK. Um, you have great fondness for Her Majesty the Queen. Indeed, I am a profound royalist, and um, for me it was very, very important to come at a very quiet time. I needed to come here to contemplate very early in the morning, and as far as I'm concerned, the Queen, and her, in particular, and the royal, gen, uh, the royal family in, in general, they encompass all the values which I believe in, all the, the British values which brought me here, um, the continuity, the history, the culture, and without it, I don't think I could have lived in, in, in a place. So for me, the greatest place to live is the, the UK, London, to be able to share the same values with other people, with fellow citizens. For me, it was very, very important to come down here this morning as well. Because perhaps we as Brits take the royal family for granted to a certain extent, Indeed. arguably, and, and, and we forget just, just how well renowned, how well respected, how well loved she was, not just across the Commonwealth, but around the globe. Indeed, and I think it takes, sometimes if you grow up with it, you take mm. it for granted, as you've just said. For me, I grew up with my love to the UK, um, to the royal family, um, uh, and as an historian, something which I've always cherished. Um, and I must admit that uh, amongst many of my friends and colleagues, I could see that people who came later on in life to live here, they are the ones who actually feel the need to express the feelings um, in, in such a way more than others. So it is very interesting. And uh, But I am grateful, grateful to the Queen and the Royal Family for actually allowing us to live in the safest place um, on earth. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Lovely to see you all and to talk to you all this morning. Uh, interesting, isn't it, Sally, to hear these different perspectives. I've said this over the last few days uh, repeatedly, really. Everybody's come for their own reason. They all feel a personal compulsion, perhaps, really, to come here to 
maybe talk to others, maybe spend some time with others, share some memories. We've seen some wonderful photos that people have been showing us over the last few days. People very keen not only to pay their respects, but to have that shared experience, I think, of remembering and honouring Her Majesty's life. Sally, back to you. John, thanks very much indeed. And I'll tell you what you do get a real sense of here, that is that the whole world is continuing to reflect on the loss of Queen Elizabeth II. And in the early hours of this morning, Australia held a proclamation ceremony in honour of King Charles III, followed by a gun salute. Let's speak to our Australia correspondent, Shima Khalil. Uh, morning, Shima. How are people there reacting? Morning, Sally. It's so interesting to hear you and John speaking to people there because you get the same feeling here. King Charles III has been officially proclaimed as Australia's ruling monarch and head of state in a ceremony uh, that happened in Canberra and it was announced by the Governor General and also uh, co-signed by the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. Uh, the Governor General said this is the dawn of a new era. Here in Sydney, um, a similar ceremony um, has happened, a state uh, proclamation outside the New South Wales um, Parliament House and there were large crowds outside Parliament House there to mark this occasion, this once in a lifetime uh, occasion. And you could see from, you know, the, the, the emotions around the place. It was quiet at times. And then there were cheers, of course, when the announcement happened. People cheered God Save the King for the first time. And of course, they sang along the new rendition of the anthem God Save the King. And when I spoke to several people there, some said, the Queen is the only monarch we knew all our lives. Some reflected on memories of her when she visited Australia. And they said, we used to travel far just to get a glimpse of her and be amongst the crowds. And now that she's gone, we wanted to be among the crowd as well. We spoke to young families who brought their children, their small children. And they said, we wanted to be here to pay respect uh, to the Queen and her service, but also to have our kids present at this momentous moment in history. Of course, the Queen made history uh, when she arrived here at Sydney Harbour in 1954 for the first time, being the only reigning monarch uh, to visit Australia. And since then, she visited a total of 16 times. There was always this affinity uh, with the monarch. People felt that she wasn't just the head of state, wasn't just the Queen of Australia. She was a friend of the country and its people, and many spoke about their mem memories. There was a mix of feeling, a sadness, a profound sadness at the loss of Queen Elizabeth but also hope um, in the new uh, reign of King Charles III. And many people have said, look, it doesn't matter if you're a monarchist or a Republican, if you want Australia to still have King Charles as the head of state, or you want Australia to become a republic with a president. Right now is not the time. There may be a referendum later on down the line, but right now is a time of reflection, a time of appreciation for the Queen, for a life that was dedica dedicated to service and duty, but also um, a look at the new king and welcome to, new, uh, to the new king, uh, King Charles III. Um, September the 22nd is going to be a national day of mourning, and it has been announced as a national holiday as well. Shaima, thank you very much indeed. That's Shaima Khalil reporting for us from Sydney this morning. Now here, lots of sporting events have been cancelled this weekend, but the test will resume and the Great North Run goes ahead today. Our sports correspondent, Joe Wilson, has been looking at which events have been cancelled after the Queen's death. When famous arenas of sport are truly brought to silence, there is a profound effect. At the Oval, it was a sustained, subdued reflection. And then the anthem. that marked this test match as a unique occasion. England bowled out South Africa for just 118, and then they were 154 for seven in reply at the close. Remarkable numbers, but the day will be remembered for far more. It felt right to be here, actually. It felt like sport can bring people together in, in tough times and, and show respect and actually celebrate the Queen's life and you know she, she, she loved her sport. It felt great walking onto the field wearing the, the badge with the crown on together as a group. It, it, it felt like the right thing to do and I think every player was delighted when the game was uh, decided that it would continue. Wherever professional sport was played the scenes were similar. 
the competitors paying their respects and spectators sharing private emotions in these public settings. There is again no football today, but there is horse racing. This is 1955 at the St. Ledger. Queen Elizabeth at the centre of the sport she loved through her life. The race in Doncaster, one of the traditional classics, dates back to the 18th century. The Queen's horse, Dunfermline, won in 1977, Jubilee year. This year's race has been rescheduled for today and will be a way for the sport to give thanks. Racing knows it was the Queen's involvement which brought so much of the interest, credibility and investment to sustain the whole sport. Joe Wilson, BBC News. Now, the Great North Run is, of course, one of the sporting events that will go ahead today, although organisers have said it will be taking a place in a more subdued form this year. Well, Alison Freeman is in Newcastle for us this morning. Morning, Alison. Yeah, good morning. It is the 41st Great North Run that is going to take place today. But as you say, it's going to have a very different tone to uh, past years. Uh, that's because organisers say the uh, £25 million that's likely to be raised by runners this year really reflects the uh, Queen's service to the nation over her long reign. Now, this is the first year in about three years that it's getting back to normal in other ways. It was cancelled in 2020 due to the pandemic. Last year, it took a different route and was staggered to adhere to social distancing. But this year, it is going to follow the normal route from the central motorway here in Newcastle over the Tyne Bridge to South Shields. But there's going to be a few differences. At the start, faith leaders are going to address the runners. There's going to be a minute silence uh, and then a rendition of the national anthem. But as I say, it's that charitable element that the organisers say reflects what the Queen has done for this country. Um, I'm joined now by three ladies who take part every year for the past 12 years, I think it is, in the Great North Run. Um, Catherine, just tell me a little bit about why you think it's so important that today's run does take place. Um, I think the Queen was very invested in charity. I think that she was a great supporter of a number of charities, I believe over 600. And, you know, it, to be able to go out there and to, to celebrate her and to and the, the ethos that she had. She was also a real fun loving lady. And I think there's a lot of ways that we can celebrate her and, and, and acknowledge what she's done for the country and what a service. You told me you felt inspired by her actually. Yeah, yeah. I think anybody who can give that level of service to be just a girl when she became, when she came to the throne and 96 years old two days you know she was still doing her job and what an amazing lady i wish i could be like that <laughs> Well, look, you do a service to a charity, don't you? Every year you run. Yeah. Tell me about the charity you're running for. Uh, so year. I'm running for Crohn's and Colitis UK. Um, my family directly and some friend, quite a few friends have been affected by Crohn's or um, colitis, ulcerative colitis. And it's just a, a really important thing to get research done to get people better and to allow them to have much better lives and different options. Thank you, Cathy. Good luck today. Uh, I'm on to Cathy now. Sorry, Catherine. Cathy, <laughs> you make it difficult for me. Um, Cathy, just tell me about the charity you're running for today. I'm running for Paw Prince Cat Rescue, a local cat rescue to me in Bradford. Um, there's a crisis at the moment, certainly for a lot of animals. Covid has had a great big impact on people and pets have been one of the things to suffer. And now with the finance situation, again, they need all the help they can get. And it has been difficult for charity, hasn't it, past two years, with events like this being called off? It has. It's been a great big fundraiser. Obviously, while COVID happened, we couldn't get out and do the fundraising. There couldn't be tombolas and things. We need help more than ever. And at a time when people are actually feeling the pinch themselves, it's one of the things that stops. How do you think it's going to feel today? Emotional. I aren't going to lie. It will be emotional. We've all, all our lives have known the Queen. That's all we have known. So how can we not? We feel like we've lost a grandma. It, it does feel emotional. It'd be important to be part of it. Perfect description, actually, yes. On to you now, Cheryl. Um, you've been in the presence of the Queen, you were telling me. Yes, I was fortunate um, about four years ago to attend one of the Buckingham Palace garden parties through another charity that I was um, supporting at the time. And, um, yeah, just a, an amazing occasion. A lot of people there, but she made people feel they were individuals. Um, just, to, yeah, just a wonderful presence to her. Um, yeah, amazing lady. 
So you talk about, um, we're talking about charities again, you work for a number of charities. Again, do you feel it is important that that charitable side of today is at the forefront, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. As Cathy was um, saying, I think charities have suffered a lot over the last couple of years. Um, and now obviously we're hitting a bit of a kind of a financial crisis as well. So, so events like this today uh, are just amazing to, in terms of giving the, those charities the support that they don't necessarily get from need, for, uh, don't receive from other places. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming out early to talk to me today. Good luck as ever. Um, things are going to be kicking off around 20 past 10 when Sir Brendan Foster will be giving a speech at the start line to all of the runners. Sally. Alison, thank you very much indeed. I can tell you, just coming up to 7 o'clock here on Sunday morning, it is one of those mornings it is a real privilege to be up very early. London is looking beautiful, a little bit misty at the moment, I can tell you. There you can see glorious shot of the Mall, Buckingham Palace, shrouded in mist. You see there the Mall, the red carpet that leads all the way up to Buckingham Palace. And over the last couple of days, of course, many, many people have walked along there to lay their flowers at the gates. You can see here preparations underway for the many more people who are expected to arrive here today. Obviously, it's the weekend now. More people here, as John Maguire was showing us, people who are visiting the UK, taking their moment here at Buckingham Palace to come and pay their respects to the Queen. You know, when Prince William, now the Prince of Wales and Princess of Wales, got married in 2011, a million people crowded along the Mall to see them on the balcony and I know we can expect many, many people over the coming days to walk along the Mall and up to Buckingham Palace to take their time and spend a moment in front of these gates. As I said, things looking quite misty here just coming up to 7 o'clock on Sunday morning but let's see how the weather is looking for the rest of the UK. Here's staff. Thank you. Good morning to you. Well, it looks like part two of the weekend will be drier and sunnier than yesterday. I feel quite warm into the afternoon as well, but we have a new area of low pressure which will work into western areas later on, bringing some rain, particularly to Northern Ireland. And you can see it showing up clearly here on the pressure chart. High pressure, though, holds on across much of the country, bringing fine and settled conditions throughout the day. But it will be quite a chilly start across Scotland, England, Wales. Some mist and fog patches around first thing, which could be quite dense for a while. They'll tend to lift and break. And then we should see plenty of sunshine in the afternoon, but a fair weather cloud bubbling up, and that might herald an isolated light shower. For Northern Ireland, though, it will be turning much wetter into the afternoon and the winds will be picking up from the south. However, I think it's going to be a slightly warmer day today. We're up to 21 degrees in Inverness, up to 23 degrees across the south and east of England. But some of this rain across Northern Ireland will be heavy and thundering. It'll continue to push its way northwards and eastwards overnight into much of Scotland, Northern England and Northern and Western Wales. Some rumbles of thunder even further south. Behind it, something a little bit fresher, just pushing to the northwest of Scotland. Otherwise... It's a mild and muggy night for all areas, particularly warm across the south. So for Monday then, we'll have that weather front line through central areas, being a rather grey, damp day here, very slowly sinking southwards. But for much of southern Britain, dry, sunny and very warm, maybe an odd shower here. Bright for Scotland, Northern Ireland, but we will see some blustery showers across the north and west of Scotland. Temperatures will be coming down here. So the uh, mid to high teens in the north, up to the mid-twenties across the south and east. And then into Tuesday, well, it looks like we're all into that fresher air. That weather front would have spread southwards. Uh, should see quite a bit of sunshine around, though, thanks to high pressure trying to build in. it would be noticeably cool in the north and across the south, highs of 21 or 22 degrees. So it does look like this area of high pressure will continue to establish itself to the west of the UK as we move deeper on into the week. Low pressure over Scandinavia, that will open the floodgates to a northerly wind for a while. And that will bring down some colder air, which will be noticeable across all areas by the end of the week, but most noticeably across the northern half of the country. But because higher pressure wants to influence our weather throughout the week, once we lose the rain early in the week, it will turn dry with some sunshine, but it'll be noticeably cooler by day and by night. That's it. I'll see you later. Good morning. Welcome to Breakfast with me, John Kay, at the Palace of Holyrood House here in Edinburgh. And Sally Nugent is at Buckingham Palace. Here are our headlines today. The first stage of the Queen's final journey begins as her coffin is driven from Balmoral to Edinburgh. 
before being flown to London on Tuesday. The Queen is due to lie in state for four days here in the capital before a state funeral at Westminster Abbey on Monday the 19th of September. Members of the royal family have thanked mourners who've gathered to remember the Queen, including an unexpected show of unity from Princes William and Harry. Good morning. It's Sunday the 11th of September. I'm at the gates of the Palace of Holyrood House here in Edinburgh, the official residence of the British monarch in Scotland, and this site will become the focus of the ceremony that is to become. Over the next couple of days, Edinburgh will be watched by the world because the Queen's coffin will arrive here later today from Balmoral. And this morning, as the sun rises, it's a little bit chilly. There's a real sense of autumn, but there's a real sense of peace here as well as people come to this city to witness this extraordinary moment in our history. So let me just explain a bit about the route uh, that the coffin will take today. It will begin at around 10 o'clock this morning when the Queen's coffin will be carried by six of her gamekeepers from her beloved Scottish estate at Balmoral from the ballroom there to a waiting hearse. And from there it will begin a long journey, a six hour journey, 175 miles and the route will pass from Balmoral through Aberdeen and then on to Dundee before finally arriving here at the palace in Edinburgh, where it will lie overnight in the throne room until Monday afternoon. Well, our correspondent Judith Moritz has been out here on the Royal Mile talking to those who are going to be involved in the ceremony over the next couple of days, and she can explain from their perspective what we can expect. The eyes of the world are about to turn to Edinburgh. And step by step, beat by beat, the pageantry must be perfect. In this city, no one wants to put a foot wrong. This was yesterday's dress rehearsal. Today will be the real thing. Those with ceremonial responsibilities a feeling a mixture of pressure and pride. It's a huge responsibility. I have been the Lord Provost and the Lord Lieutenant for just a few weeks, and I just hope I live up to the expectations of me, and, I hope, and I'm sure that the city will put on a, a very determined show of its respect for the Queen in the next few days. Three cheers for His Majesty the King! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Yesterday, the public proclamation of the new king at St James's Ladies Palace in London began a series of historic ceremonies. I am deeply aware of this great inheritance and of the duties and heavy responsibilities of sovereignty which have now passed to me. In taking up these responsibilities, I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set in upholding constitutional government and to seek the peace, harmony and prosperity of the peoples of these islands. But as well as the formal events, there were also moments for family. At Windsor, William and Catherine together with Harry and Meghan, came to meet well-wishers and share memories of their grandmother, the Queen. And at Balmoral, Princes Andrew and Edward, Princess Anne, their spouses and children, read some of the many tributes, which prompted obvious emotions and a tender moment as Princess Eugenie held on to her father for comfort. Today, the focus will move from the monarch's summer residence to the Scottish capital. Because the Queen died at Balmoral, it set in train a whole sequence of events in Scotland that wouldn't have happened had she passed away in London. And so its capital city is readying itself as the Queen's coffin is brought here and Edinburgh becomes the centre of events for the next few days.
On Monday, the King will join the procession as the coffin is brought along the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral, where the Queen will lie at rest. Anybody can talk about faith, but to live it is what makes a difference to people. And I think she lived it, and she lived it in the way... Reverend Liz Henderson is one of the royal chaplains and is preparing for the service of prayer and reflection to be held at the cathedral. When you look around Edinburgh, you can see that building, can't you? The, the place is getting busier and busier and there are more people gathering and they are particularly in this part of the old town. And so the focus is very much on St Giles. It has particular significance um, for this service because the Queen actually came here just three weeks after her coronation in June 1953. And it was here that she was blessed by the then moderator of the Church of Scotland and the Dean of the Chapel Royal. As flowers continue to arrive, news crews keep coming too. Demain matin, à 11h heure française, le château de Balmoral pour rejoindre le palais d'Hollywood. Here, from all over the globe. French people are fascinated by the royal family, by all the stories. Uh, they don't want monarchy in France, but uh, they are very attached by the royal family. When we learned uh, when we were on set in Paris that something uh, was about to happen, we were all very sad. We were all very sad. I come from Italy, from Rome, and the minute we heard the news that the Queen was sick, we just flew to Great Britain and then we moved to Balmora because it's of a huge impact in Italy as well. We, we're very interested into British monarchy. Yesterday we had half an hour of, um, dedicated to this, uh, to this event and we're going to keep, keep going on for the next few days until the official funeral. Amongst the pomp and protocol, there are the people. Once the Queen's subjects, now the King's all witnessing history as it happens around them. Judith Moritz, BBC News, Edinburgh. You really do sense right across this city uh, that, that, that sense of expectation and duty, as, as Judith was saying, that uh, people here in Edinburgh and across Scotland really want to play their part over the next couple of days uh, of saying farewell, a Scottish farewell, to Queen Elizabeth. The second uh, on the Royal Mall last night, where, where Judith was filming, uh, we bumped into a man who, who has a gift shop, one of the many gift shops along the Royal Mile, and he was telling me that he'd just been overwhelmed with people turning up yesterday, wanting to buy anything they possibly could that referred to the Queen. Uh, he, he'd almost sold out of, of platinum jubilee tea towels with a, a picture of Her Majesty on it. Uh, just people wanted something, anything, uh, something tangible to take away, to own, uh, that, that in some way referred to her and her connection with Edinburgh. And uh, there is that sense here this morning because through the night uh, there have been rehearsals and I just want to show you these pictures of uh, the rehearsals that have been taking place in the dark of members of the military preparing for that moment later today when the hearse arrives at the Palace of Holyrood House. We think that will be at about four o'clock this afternoon. The military using the nighttime hours when there are no crowds around to prepare for that, to make sure they're absolutely precise and perfect in the pageantry. And I think it's only when you see these pictures, isn't it? Even though these are rehearsals that you can begin to imagine what we're going to see for real in Edinburgh and in London and Windsor over the next week. Well, the coffin begins its journey this morning at Balmoral Castle, the Queen's beloved Balmoral estate. And our Royal Correspondent, Sarah Campbell, is there for us this morning. And Sarah, she spoke often and with, with real fondness about Balmoral, didn't she? So it's, it's so poignant that she will leave there for the final time uh, today. Yes, good morning to you, John. Um, it is so peaceful 
here, so tranquil. Uh, this morning as the sun has risen over the, the glens that surround this beautiful part of the country, really the only sound has been the sound of the birds, the sound of the River Dee, which is just 100 metres or so away from where I am in front of the gates to Balmoral Castle. And as you say, the Queen loved it here. She cherished it here. And it is here that over the last three days since her death on Thursday that her family have gathered behind those gates uh, and yesterday they emerged they drove in convoy to nearby Crathy Kirk uh, it's the church where the Queen worshipped so often here during those long summers she spent on the estate and when they returned Princess Anne and her family Prince Andrew and his two daughters, Beatrice and Eugenie, and the uh, Earl and Countess of Wessex and their daughter, Lady Louise. They got out of those cars, they walked along, walked across the bridge, across the River Dee, spoke to some of those people that had travelled to be here to lay their tributes, said thank you to them, and then spent a few minutes just having a look for themselves, reading some of the hundreds of messages that have been left, uh, standing next to those flowers, which really this morning smell so beautiful, um, and then went back into the gates, but turned round, faced the crowd, and just gave a little wave, and the audience, uh, the, so the, the, the people who had queued up here, just clapped, gave some applause and I think sort of a mutual acknowledgement of the loss that the nation is currently coming to terms with but also obviously the family members are coming to terms with losing their mother and their grandmother and the Queen we now know since her death on Thursday has been in the ballroom here at Balmoral Castle in an oak coffin covered with the Royal Standard for Scotland and a wreath of flowers and at 10 o'clock this morning, that coffin will be carried to the waiting hearse and will be driven through the gates here to start the journey to Edinburgh, the first stopping point for the coffin. It is a journey of around 175 miles, a specially planned out route, taking in the cities of Aberdeen, Dundee, Perth, it will travel slowly, it will take six hours to make that journey and it will allow as many people as is possible to pay their own tributes as the Queen's coffin passes by. And Sarah, you're talking about the, the peace and the tranquility of Balmoral is what the Queen loved. Of course, it's, it's remote, isn't it? it? It's difficult for the public to get there, which makes the sight of all those flowers, all those visitors we've seen over the last couple of days all the more remarkable, really. Yes, we think around 4,000 people made the journey here yesterday. And as you say, it is a remote part of the country and it's not even easy when you get here. It's quite a restricted entrance. And so the police have organised it so that people have to drive to Ballater, leave their cars there, get on a coach, come here and they are ushered through by the police. Of course, you'll see that there is nobody here behind me at the moment because the decision has been made to keep the public away until after the Queen's coffin has left. And then they will continue to be allowed to come and leave those tributes. Um, but the people that I've spoken to over the last few days, they just wanted to be here. They wanted to feel that they had given their tribute, made their tribute. Many of them knew her. She was very much seen as a member of the community. She spent such a lot of time here. And many people have brought children far too young to know that they are participating in a, in a moment of history. But people saying to me, we just want them as they grow up to have a connection with the Queen in the way that we have <coughs> excuse me, in the way that we have over all of these years, because of course all they will know is a king going forward, but for the rest of us we have lived our lives with the Queen as our monarch. And we were talking earlier, John, weren't we, when that, that moment, <coughs> I think when the, the coffin passes through those gates, for those of us who still almost find it hard to believe that the Queen is gone, that will be the moment when reality uh, is made obvious uh, and it's no longer surreal, it's real. That's right, Sarah.
at Balmoral. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, that's, that's what so many people have said to us here uh, over the last few hours, people who are determined to be here on the Royal Mile outside the Palace of Holyrood House a little bit later and tomorrow, that they want to be here because they want to kind of see it, take it in, understand it until they see the coffin, the hearse and the pageantry beginning. They, they, so many of them say they, they just still can't really believe what has happened so quickly, so suddenly in just the last couple of days. I'm sure it's a sentiment that's felt at Buckingham Palace in London as well, where we've seen such huge crowds over the last few days. And Sally is there for us this morning. Hi, Sal. Hi, John. Yeah, you make a really interesting point, and it's looking at Sarah's shots there from Balmoral. It's interesting to contrast the scene that we have here at Buckingham Palace as the crowds start to gather. Obviously, this is a you know a huge, iconic symbol of the monarchy here in the UK, and lots and lots of people have been travelling here over the last few days to honour the UK's longest serving monarch. You can see there, just from that shot, look at the mist over the palace at the moment. That mist we thought was going to clear so far, it hasn't. You can tell there the palace just at the end of the mile, if you can make it out, shrouded in mist this morning. We're hoping the sun might come out for us a little bit, but maybe that will happen later on today. Many, many people expected on that mile throughout the day here and floral tributes children's drawings of her majesty queen elizabeth ii have all been left here over the last couple of days and outside royal residences across the uk um, we have our correspondent john maguire who is out talking to people who are coming here to pay their respects we'll talk to him in just a moment but first let's talk to our diplomatic correspondent paul adams who is at clarence house for us this morning where the new king is preparing for events to come later on here at Buckingham Palace. Now, morning, Paul. We know that King Charles III has a busy agenda today. What's going to be happening? Yeah, good morning, Sally. I'm standing literally, what, a couple of hundred yards from where you are, outside Clarence House. This has been uh, the king's official residence as Prince of Wales for uh, quite a long time. It's a place rich in family associations at one time or another, his, both his wife uh, sorry, his mother and his grandmother lived here. Uh, and we don't actually know when King Charles and the Queen Consort will move out of Clarence House and down to Buckingham Palace. But while attention is very much on events up in Scotland today, for King Charles, it's all about uh, establishing himself as the new monarch, getting on with the business of the monarchy. Uh, yesterday, he got to meet the cabinet. And today, it's all about the 56 members of the Commonwealth. He'll leave here mid-morning, head to Buckingham Palace, to the office if you like, and have a meeting there with the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Baroness Scotland, and then attend a reception for diplomatic representatives of the 14 countries that still regard the monarch as their head of state. Countries like Canada, Australia, New Zealand and Jamaica. King Charles has made many references already to his determination to continue his mother's legacy when it comes to the Commonwealth an institution that she was particularly closely associated with. And she made it clear uh, that she wanted uh, her son to continue as the head of the Commonwealth. And in 2018, the leaders of the Commonwealth agreed that that would indeed be the case. There will be challenges ahead for King Charles uh, as Commonwealth leaders consider their relationship both with the Crown and with the United Kingdom. Only last year, Barbados decided to become a republic and there will be moments like that for King Charles to, to deal with. In the case of Barbados, he went there himself, he acknowledged and recognised the process. So there will be those moments, but that's not really uh, for today, that's for the future. Uh, for now, it's all about King Charles saying to those representatives that he is determined to continue to lead the Commonwealth as strongly and successfully as his mother did. Paul, thanks very much indeed. That's Paul Adams, our diplomatic correspondent. Now, special services will be held in churches across the UK today, looking back on the life of the Queen and praying for King Charles III. It will be an opportunity for congregations to reflect on how the Queen's own faith guided her throughout her life. Our religion editor, Ali McBall, reports. Across the country, church bells have been muffled. They've told in solemnity in remembrance of Queen Elizabeth II. 
Church doors have been opened for those who want to sit and pray for and reflect on the life of the Queen. Special services will be held all over Britain today. The Queen was Supreme Governor of the Church of England, but she left governance to the bishops as an ever-ready listener for them. It was clear her own faith ran deep. The head of the Catholic Church in England and Wales remembers a national service at St Paul's Cathedral. At a certain point in the ceremony, we were all asked to recite a long prayer, which was printed out in the order of service. And I looked up and the Queen had her eyes shut and she was reciting this prayer by heart. And I thought, there's a woman who prays, who probably prays every day. Of course, there was a moment every year where we were given an insight into how much the Queen's faith guided her, and that was in her Christmas broadcasts. For me, the life of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, whose birth we celebrate today, is an inspiration and an anchor in my life. A role model of reconciliation and forgiveness, he stretched out his hands in love, acceptance and healing. Christ's example has taught me to seek to respect and value all people of whatever faith or none. And in recent decades, she visited temples, synagogues, gurdwaras and mosques as the nation grew in diversity. Those who knew her talk of a deep interest in other faiths. I accompanied her on her visit to Bergen-Belsen, a concentration camp in Germany. And there I could see the extent um, of her connection with Jews and Judaism and her concern for the safety of Jews. Bishops through the years always point to those moments when her own belief shone through. In the Christmas message, she's got an amazing statement. In the bleak midwinter, that wonderful Christmas carol, at the end asks a question. What can I give him? And he says, a carol provides the answer, give him my heart. Now, that's what you'd hear on the lips of preachers, of evangelists. When they gathered for her in reflection at St Paul's, they gave thanks for the Queen's reign, for her service and her faith. They commemorated the way she guided the church in a fast evolving world and her commitment to bring all people together. Aline McGool, BBC News. The Queen being remembered in religious services across the country today. And so many people have been sharing their memories of the Queen and what she meant to them. John Maguire has been meeting some of them for us this morning and over the last couple of days. Uh, John, I believe you have some more people to share their stories. Yes, not too hard to find people, Sally, because everybody, it seems, has a story. Everybody obviously has come here to, to pay respects, to reflect, to think about what the Queen meant to them during their lifetime. So lots of people to talk to, and it's a pleasure to talk to them, I must say, as well. Quick scene set for you. Uh, you will see some flowers are being laid at the gates of Buckingham Palace still. Uh, but what's happened over the last couple of days is that the flowers have been moved to Green Park, just right next to Buckingham Palace here, just behind me. Um, and when you go over to Green Park, I think there were some pictures in uh, Tim Muffet's film earlier on. There's literally a sea of floral tributes and some common themes throughout. A lot of people saying how thankful they are to Her Majesty for her decades of service. Lots of Paddingtons. There's this link now, it seems, with Paddington. Uh, lots of notes. Just a few words sometimes, sometimes much more elaborate. We're going to introduce you to the Anstey family. Good morning to you all. Good morning. Uh, very nice to see you here this morning, Jenny, and to John, and we have Rupert, Dora, and Henrietta. Uh, why come along this morning, do you think? John, well, we felt it was really important to come and pay our respects to the Queen. Um, we haven't actually taken the children to Buckingham Palace before, ah. so it was an opportunity to come and show them what all the talk is about. And Dora was rather hoping we might see Paddington here today. Right. <laughs> well. well, there are a lot of Paddingtons around, I must say. Uh, John, we've, we've, we've known the Queen for our entire lives, haven't we? We have. She's been a constant in all of our lives. And uh, it came as such a 
such a shock. You never know until it's actually happened how you feel. But we wanted to thank her for her love, devotion and service that she's given to us. We, we, we've 96 years old, so, we, so we've all known, of course, this day is coming. But, but it, it, a lot of people that I've been speaking to has said that it has affected them, perhaps in a way they might not have imagined. Has that been the case with you? Well, as we've been hearing, she feels, feels like we've all this feeling of loss and grief. She's like a relative. She's like, a, like so many people said, like a grandmother to us and being this figurehead. And uh, we just felt as a mark of respect to really come, come along and just say a small prayer for her. Rupert, good morning yeah, to you. Good morning. Tell me about uh, your, your thoughts about the Queen and, and, and why you're, you've come along. You probably didn't have any choice, but, but why, <laughs> why you've come along today. Uh, so, at school, yes. uh, we were doing a biography and I chose to write about the Queen. Ah, and okay. I And I, I also thought that it would be amazing to just come and pay our respect. Yeah. And what sort of things did you write about the Queen and why did you choose her for your project? Uh, so she inspires me a lot and uh, I, I just thought I couldn't choose anyone else. Wow, that's wonderful. Henrietta, hello. How are you? Are you OK? Yeah. Uh, and tell me, have you been studying the Queen at school as well yeah. and talking about her? Yeah, and we were... Um, so we, that we, what we had at school, that it was a face of the Queen, and we were writing how amazing our Queen is inside ah. of the head. Do you remember what you wrote? Um, I wrote gracious, yes. kind, and I can't remember anything well, else. Well, I think gracious and kind are two fantastic adjectives, aren't they? Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Folks, thank you so thank much you. for talking to us this morning. Really nice to see you. Thank you. Um, enjoy your time. It sounds like a strange thing to say in a certain uh, regard, but, but I think that people are... The atmosphere's changing, I think, Sally, perhaps as people are, are getting used to the news. Uh, it's been a couple of days now, of course, but as we keep saying, they've come for their own reasons, to spend a little bit of time at Buckingham Palace. It's quiet here at the moment. It will get much, much busier. That's certainly what's happened over the last couple of days. And despite the throngs, the thousands and thousands, that will come here later as they have been, as I say, in recent times. There's still a quietness here and, and there's something I think very powerful, very special about a lot of people not making much noise. And again, that's because I think there's a solemnness, there's a chance to reflect, a chance to think. Uh, and that's what we're hearing from people over and over again. And it's a real privilege to hear from them, I think. Sally, back to you. John, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Lots and lots of families here over the last couple of days, and isn't it interesting how it's actually the children who have the most beautiful things to say. So thank you to everybody who's been talking to us. Now, Sunday with Laura Koonsberg follows us on Breakfast This Morning. Laura, what can we expect on the show today? Good morning, Sally. Well, one of the things that's such a key part of how the state works is that relationship between the monarch and their prime minister of the day and to try to understand a bit more about that special relationship today on the program we'll hear from three former prime ministers David Cameron, Theresa May and Gordon Brown with their reflections, some happy memories, a bit of laughter about how they interacted with the Queen and the royal family. Some really incredible anecdotes from their time at Balmoral with her. But also we'll hear their real serious reflections about how that wiring of the country really works. So a bit of an insight behind closed doors into those private conversations between Queen Elizabeth, the now late Majesty, and her private ministers, 15 of them, of course, in the end. But we've also asked them to talk about their knowledge of the new king and to pose a few questions about the kind of monarch that he might be. So we'll be hearing from those three and I'll be joined by a panel here in the studio to talk about a lot more else on this huge day. Laura, thank you very much indeed. We will look forward to it. Now, let me just bring you a shot of the mall this morning as we approach half past seven here on BBC Breakfast. You can see that mist really coming in now. Not deterring the crowds though, the crowds are building certainly over the last hour or so. Many people coming down 
early here on Sunday morning, perhaps anticipating many more people coming throughout the day. So as you can see, very, very misty here this morning. But let's see how the weather is looking across the rest of the UK. Thank you. Good morning to you. Well, it's looking like being a drier part two of the weekend with more sunshine around today with high pressure continuing to dominate. But there will be some rain pushing into western areas later on. All could see this new area of low pressure. Some of the rain will be quite heavy for a time across Northern Ireland into this evening. But high pressure holds on across much of the country. Light winds, quite a chilly start today. Some early mist and fog, which will tend to lift and break. And then we should see quite a bit of sunshine around. Just a slim chance of an isolated light shower. Further west, though, it starts to turn cloudier, breezier, much wetter, certainly for Northern Ireland. Temperatures up to around 21 degrees, though, northern Scotland with the sunshine, up to 23 degrees across the southeast. But it turns very much wet across Northern Ireland, then into Scotland, Northern England, Northern and Western Wales this evening and overnight. Could have some rumbles of thunder with that rain, and behind it, some blustery showers pushing to the far northwest of Scotland, but dry and quite mild and muggy across the south. So for Monday then, we have a three-way split. Central areas will see that weather front rather damp with outbreaks of rain. To the north of it, it's cooler sunshine and some blustery showers in the northwest of Scotland. But southern Britain will be drier with some sunshine and feeling quite warm up to 25 degrees there. Maybe an odd heavy shower but fresher in the north. That fresher air in the north does spread southwards uh, as we move into Tuesday, maybe a few showers on it. And then high pressure builds into the west, so it'll be largely settled to the latter part of the week, but it will be turning cooler. Hello, good morning. You're watching BBC Breakfast this Sunday morning. I'm John Kay, live at the gates of the Palace of Holyrood House here in Edinburgh where the Queen's coffin will arrive from Balmoral later today. This city just waking up this Sunday morning, knowing that the eyes of the world are going to be watching. The focus will remain here in Edinburgh for the next couple of days before it moves to London, where the Queen will lie in state for four days ahead of her funeral at Westminster Abbey. That will be a week tomorrow, Monday, the 19th of September. But I know lots of people want to know what can uh, we can expect to happen over the next few days ahead? Uh, what are the key moments to look out for? Our diplomatic correspondent, James Landale, has uh, assessed that for us. Six of the Queen's gamekeepers will carry the coffin to a hearse that will drive slowly south, taking six hours to reach the palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh. The following afternoon, just after half past two, the coffin will travel in military procession along the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral, with the King and other members of the Royal Family following on foot. There, after a service involving people from all parts of Scottish society, the Queen's body will lie in rest for 24 hours to allow the public to pay their respects. There'll be a continuous vigil held by the Royal Company of Archers and, just after 7pm, by the King himself. On Tuesday afternoon, the coffin, accompanied by the Princess Royal, will be flown to Northolt Airport in London and taken on to Buckingham Palace. From there, on Wednesday afternoon, the Queen's coffin will leave the palace, conveyed up the mall by a gun carriage, the King and members of the royal family walking slowly and silently behind, with no music, just the tolling of Big Ben. Through Horse Guards, down Whitehall, the procession will end at Westminster Hall, where the Archbishop of Canterbury will conduct a short service. In this ancient building, the Queen will lie in state for four full days, her coffin mounted on a raised platform known as a catafalque, with many thousands expected to file past the coffin. And then, on Bank Holiday Monday morning, the Queen's coffin will leave Westminster Hall, and be taken in a grand military procession to Westminster Abbey. Members of the royal family are expected again to follow on foot. At 11 o'clock, the full state funeral will begin at the Abbey, where foreign statesmen, European royal families and other dignitaries will join the public in honouring the life of a queen who will be laid to rest later at St George's Chapel, Windsor. James Landale, BBC News. But before that, as we were saying, the attention will be here in Edinburgh. And joining me now is the leader of Edinburgh Council, Cammy Day. Thanks for, for joining us on Breakfast this morning, Cammy. Um, just walking around last night, you could feel the, the sense of responsibility in this city, uh, that people want to get this absolutely perfect. 
Yeah, I mean, the Queen herself is involved in planning up the arrangements for this to happen, and uh, the city has responded amazingly. We've seen the council staff, our workforce, and our old partners pull together as soon as this happened. The city was ready, and the city is looking great to welcome Her Majesty back into Edinburgh today. You say ready. What struck me when I arrived yesterday, lunchtime, is, is how ready it already felt. You know, even at that point, less than 48 hours after the Queen's death. But everything was in place, the barriers are there, the gantries for the cameras knowing that you know exactly how this will pr progress over the next few hours and days yeah for me it's just the years of planning we put into this with the royal household with the the many services that are here today but again appreciation of the the huge efforts the council staff have put in to make the city get ready and the public and the public have worked, worked with us really well to make sure that they can be part of the sort of the celebration of the queen's life as we mourn over the next few days here in edinburgh these pictures we're showing now uh, our cameras caught these uh, a few hours ago during the night when the military made use of the quiet streets along the, the Royal Mile and, and to some extent the, the privacy of that so that they could carry out this rehearsal of what will happen when the hearse arrives here at the uh, Palace of Holyrood House later today and then tomorrow when the coffin is taken from the palace to St Giles's Cathedral there for uh, lying in rest and also uh, where there will be a service. It, it, there's an awful lot of pageantry that will, will take place in the heart, the ancient heart of Edinburgh, Absolutely. over the next couple of days. Yeah, and, and not only hearts, so the, the cortege will come across the Dean Bridge that people may have noticed into the heart of the city along Princess Street, then make its way down the famous Royal Mile, round the back of the castle, um, down the Lawn Market, past St Giles, past the city chambers, and you'll see all the history of Edinburgh as we pass through that well down to past the um, palace here beside us today. It's hard to judge because we've never known this before but have you got any sense of, of the number of people that, that might come to Edinburgh? Yeah I mean we expect tens of thousands that's why the city's ready for it. We have a queuing system in place which reaches back from probably the high street into the meadows but I suppose the numbers are unknown. Looks like the weather will be quite good as well so I'm sure there'll be a good turnout to I suppose, welcome Her Majesty home to Edinburgh and for people to take the, pay their respect and mourn. And are you prepared for those kind of numbers? I know you're a big capital city, you've just had the festival, you're used to plenty of visitors, but you've already got lots of visitors, foreign visitors who are here at the moment, and, and now you're going to have another influx. Yeah, I mean, the city's always welcoming people, and we are one of, you know, we, we have the festivals just said they're just finished them a few weeks ago, so we're ready for this, you know, and, and we've planned for a long, long time. We'll make sure the city's welcoming for the royal family when they arrive here tomorrow as well. And the many thousands of people from, I'm sure, across the city and across the world who will make Edinburgh their place to come in the next few days. And you'll be meeting the new king as, as part of that. Just explain it, yeah. your role as, as leader of the, the council. What, what, what's your responsibilities over the next couple of days? So today I'll take part in the proclamation of the king up at the Market Cross with the Lord Provost. And then um, tomorrow we'll join the King and some guests at the palace to do our ceremony keys to hand the keys of the, of the city over to the new King. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a proud moment for all of us here in the city and we'll all make sure we do our best to uh, I suppose, say our goodbyes to the Queen and to welcome in the new King. Just walking around here over the last few days, what, 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 how would you describe it for people who are at home who are not in Edinburgh? Do, what, what's the sense on the streets among the, the population here? I mean, I think it's... Uh, you know, people are proud to be here. The Queen's made Scotland a place she loves to visit and we've always had the Queen here in Edinburgh for the many events she's held, including the garden parties that have welcomed thousands of people into Edinburgh. I think Edinburgh people themselves are proud that the Queen's be coming back to Edinburgh and that the King will have his uh, proclamation here and the Seven and Keys. But not only the Edinburgh citizens themselves will have, I'm sure, thousands of visitors from across the world who will make this Edinburgh the place they want to be for the Queen's departure home to um, Westminster. The Queen was only here in June, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah, and some of my colleagues met her at the ceremony keys that she held back then, and they're really proud that they were able to see her that final uh, royal event she did here in Edinburgh. And again, we will take part in that new ceremony keys on Monday to as a welcome um, King Charles back to Edinburgh. For the first time. Yeah. Cammy, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for joining us here this morning. Uh, a big responsibility felt by so many people here. Uh, Cami among them, but just the same responsibility you get uh, talking, Sally, to, to people on the streets as well, that uh, everybody wants to play a part, everybody wants to witness this, everyone wants to feel that they're contributing and doing the right thing. But from the Palace of Holyrood House here, the Queen's official residence in Scotland, let's go to Buckingham Palace uh, in London. And Sally is there for us this morning. Hi, Sally. 
Thanks very much indeed, John. Yes, and we start to look ahead, don't we, at what is coming up over the next few days to talk about that in a little bit more detail and also to reflect on the Queen's faith. I'm joined now by the Lord Bishop of Southwark, Right Reverend Christopher Cheson. Morning to you. Thank you Morning, so much Sally. for coming to talk to us today. Um, We've already seen on our programme this morning, we've had a conversation about how important the Queen's faith has been during her reign, during her life. Um, what are your reflections on that? Her faith gave her an inner strength. It gave her comfort and it helped Her Late Majesty to understand her role. She became Queen unexpectedly and suddenly when she was 25 years old and has served us for 70 years. And when she signed her message on her Platinum Jubilee, it ended with your servant, Elizabeth R. It is the Christian understanding of leadership that we should follow Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve. And servant leadership is the best possible model, because then you are selfless and you're thinking of others and their needs. And she called her faith her anchor. Didn't yes, she? yes, a rock, an anchor, something which actually helped her be the wonderful person she was. It's so wonderful this morning standing here outside Buckingham Palace and just, although it's early morning, just a stream of people quietly paying their tributes. People actually want to say thank you. There is a real sense of gratitude, isn't it? Everybody we've spoken to, there's that real sense, a theme of gratitude running throughout all of this. Um, and I know you in particular, you have some very fond memories of the Queen and, and, and a favourite moment to share with us. Well, I'll tell you the funniest first. Good. But it's not the most serious. OK. <laughs> um, that is that when the Diamond Jubilee occurred, a memorial window to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee was commissioned for Southwark Cathedral. And about a year later, we heard that the Queen wanted to come and see it with Prince Philip. And, but first she wanted to see the Shard. And so she visited the Shard because of her interest in everything else. And then she came to the cathedral. And when she was standing by the Jubilee window, very beautiful, the commission was won by an Icelandic glazier. And it has lozenges, prisms of glass, which shine as if they are diamonds for the Diamond Jubilee. Um, the cathedral cat was fast asleep curled up on a cushion under the window and the Dean said your majesty one of your subjects doesn't seem particularly <laughs> overwhelmed by your presence <laughs> and to see the Queen relax and laugh <laughs> and to see her wonderful sense of humor uh, was really a great gift but the precious memory is when the Royal Artillery were moving from this part of the world from Woolwich down to Salisbury Plain to Lark Hill and they were completing that process that had gone on for some years. Uh, the Queen was invited to mark the occasion. The officers' mess had moved down finally. And I was invited, I was then Bishop of Woolwich before I became Bishop of Southwark. And I was there with my sister-in-law who was profoundly deaf. And when the Queen realized that my sister-in-law was deaf, she was wearing a Duke of Edinburgh gold award. Uh, the Queen lit up and she communicated without speech in a wonderful way with my sister-in-law so that she felt she had had a deep level of engagement with the Queen. And the Queen, not least, was saying how in the royal family there is quite a long history of deafness among her own relatives. And for lots of people who are coming here today, it does give them a chance, a moment, doesn't it, to reflect on their own losses. Do you think we're feeling a sense of collective loss? There are two things, I think, happening. One is that people are telling their stories, as you have just encouraged me to do. And, the, and it may, for some, have just been seeing the Queen, or a moment in their lives where they felt associated with a national event, and the Queen has been presiding over that. The other is that it brings to the surface all our losses, human loss, uh, the price of love is grief, as the Queen herself said. And there is a deep sense of national loss. There is also a sense of hope, because no one could be better prepared and prepared by the Queen than the King, uh, King Charles, who we have all known as the Prince of Wales for so long. 
Bishop Christopher, thank you so much for spending some time with us this morning. It's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Sally. Now, we know, don't we, that thousands of people have been paying their tributes to the Queen since her death was announced on Thursday. And yesterday, in a surprise show of unity, the new Prince and Princess of Wales and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex appeared together to greet well-wishers and look at the floral tributes outside Windsor Castle. Well, our royal correspondent, Daniela Ralph, has this report. Nobody had seen this coming. After the fallout and friction, it was unexpected and unannounced. Walking together through the Cambridge gates of Windsor Castle, the new Prince and Princess of Wales and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. It was a family reunited in grief. There were a few words exchanged as they looked at the flowers and tributes left to honour the Queen. All eyes were on them. The brothers have barely spoken to each other in two years, but something clearly shifted. Then to the crowds. Harry and Meghan down one side of Windsor's long walk, chatting, receiving flowers and condolences. On the other side were William and Catherine, doing much the same, particularly with families and children who'd come out to remember the Queen. It's lovely to come together, isn't it, for their nan? They both obviously love their nan very much, don't they? Time of crisis, we all need to be together. Obviously no family likes, you know, any conflict, don't fall out. No, well, obviously we don't know what's going on, but it's great to see them together. And obviously as well, it's good for the country as a whole. William Prince of Wales issued a moving personal statement about his grandmother. He said... She was by my side at my happiest moments, and she was by my side during the saddest days of my life. I knew this day would come, but it will be some time before the reality of life without Granny will truly feel real. The fractured relationship between William and Harry has shown few signs of healing. After the funeral of their grandfather, the Duke of Edinburgh, there was hope that this chat would lead to a reconciliation. There was a similar hope when the brothers came together to unveil a statue of their mother. But the hurt was deep on both sides and neither could find a peace. As they walked back, there was a joint goodbye. Bye everyone, thank you so much. Thank you everyone. And then the royal couples left together in the same car. Who knows if this is a lasting reconciliation, but the loss of the Queen has gone some way to mending a damaging family rift. Daniela Ralph, BBC News. Well, let's talk about this now in a little more detail with Camilla Tomini, Associate Editor of The Telegraph. Morning, Camilla. Morning. Thanks for talking to us this morning. Those images that we saw from late yesterday afternoon at Windsor, they're really... They're surprising. We weren't expecting the two princes to be together, were we? But they that's a real moment, isn't yes, it? Yes, very much so. It's almost one of the most remarkable royal walkabouts in recent memory in the sense that we had expected the Prince and Princess of Wales and then to see Harry and Meghan in the back of the car coming out, the Fab Four reunited. I suppose looking at those scenes, there's a degree of awkwardness because everyone's watching the body language and clearly it took a lot for both brothers to come together, put their differences aside in memory of their grandmother and it's only fitting i think the public was brought some comfort by seeing that because there is a sadness around the fact that this previously this duo these brothers in arms have been on very very different paths um look i think there is a road to reconciliation ahead it might be a bit rocky there's still the prospect of prince harry's autobiography to come which the palace and royals are worried about. They're not getting advanced sighting of this book that he promises will be his accurate and wholeful truth. So we'll have to see. But I think if there's any opportunity for a rapprochement, it must be this week, right? Um, I know it's, it's difficult for you to speculate, perhaps, but how? what do you think the thinking behind yesterday was? Was that to get that photograph out there now? Was it... I don't know, the start of a road to reconciliation, as you suggest, because at some point over the coming days, I, I imagine we would have had to have seen them all together, yes. wouldn't we? Well, I think the narrative was slightly being overshadowed with talk of this ongoing rift. You know, we saw Harry go up to Balmoral alone, reports that Meghan was going to go and then at the last minute didn't. And I think they're both conscious that from a PR perspective, the optics around that aren't good. They don't want to be overshadowing um, this 10-day mourning period. 
who knows what is actually going on inside the family but the other questions that are being asked at the moment following the briefing yesterday with further funeral arrangements is what role are Harry and Meghan actually going to play in this funeral? Is it going to be like the Platinum Jubilee celebrations where there's a distinction between working and non-working royals and what will that look like? So I think this was the Prince of Wales extended the invitation. That's also him living up to his newfound stature as the second in command of this institution. So it was a case of sort of let's rise above and try and do the right thing. We're just having another look at the images there. And you know, we mentioned, didn't we, there was a, a level of awkwardness. But also, are we looking for a level of awkwardness between Maybe. them, perhaps? I don't, it's, it's hard difficult. when you're so on show, isn't yes. it? Yes. And also, the contrasting styles there between to both couples have always been evident. You've got William yeah. and Kate, who are quite businesslike about what they're doing, yes. and then very warm with the public, yes. obviously. Then you've got Harry and Meghan, who are much more touchy-feely. But maybe yes. that also reflects their differing status yes. now. Yes, perhaps. And also in the last couple of days, we have seen other images of other members of the royal family looking very emotional, yes. haven't we, at Balmoral? It was touching, wasn't it? But not surprising. When you see the likes of um, Zara Tyndall and Princesses Eugenie and Beatrice in tears, it's because they've lost Granny. Yes, the images that we're seeing now, yeah. Um, uh, also, Sophie the Countess of Wessex, who is very close to the Queen, m much more so actually after the Queen lost her mother and Princess yes. Margaret in 2002. Of course it's emotional for the family. Just as we regard the Queen as a legend, they did two in the family, you know, Granny More to than them. any of us, yeah. Absolutely. They knew better than they, any they of us. They knew better and they, they, they obviously saw her up close and personal. So I think this just shows that as well as this being a national and global story, this is also the story of a family uh, grieving for somebody that they loved very, very dearly. And what are we expecting over the coming days? You more than most will know. Well, I think today is going to be extremely poignant because we are going to see the Queen's coffin for the first time. It's going to be convened from Balmoral, where it's been lay laying in rest um, by gamekeepers from the estate. And then it's going to take this very poignant six-hour journey down to Edinburgh. Um, this now sort of sets in train this period where the public can pay their respects physically by the coffin both in Scotland, around all four corners of the UK and finally down here in London for four days. And I think that's going to be obviously reminiscent of the scenes that we saw when the Queen Mother passed away in 2002. We're expecting miles and miles of queues. Also lining that route in Scotland, of course, people will be on the roadside and maybe that will be reminiscent perhaps of Princess Diana's coffin returning from the airport to London back in 25 years ago. Camilla, it's lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for talking to us Thank this you. morning. That's Camilla Tomlin from the Daily Telegraph. Thank you very much indeed. Well, my next guest, Sibylla Lang, has been a friend of King Charles III since their university days. She joins me now from her home in Marlborough. Uh, morning to you. Um, good to talk to you today. First of all, I'd just like to reflect for a moment and ask you how you know King Charles. Good morning, Sally. Well, first of all, I'd like to give my warm best wishes, sympathy, love and condolences and prayers to King Charles and the whole royal family at just such an awfully sad time. Um, well, we met at university. Uh, I was at the same uh, university at Cambridge. Uh, Prince Charles was at Trinity. I was at Newnham College. We were in the same year and we were reading the same subject. But there had been really a connection before that because my father was the governor general in Malta and as such worked really directly for the Queen and knew the Queen and Prince Philip. So there was a sort of connection that we were both arriving at university at the same time and we were introduced. And Sibella, would you, I, I believe we're just seeing a beautiful black and white photograph now of your parents with the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. So that family connection was already very well established. Yes, that photograph comes from uh, the Queen and Prince Philip state visit to Sierra Leone. It's um, in Freetown in 1961. Uh, and I'm sorry, I couldn't find the official family one with me aged 11. Very fortunate to be able to be there for that state visit at that age. I was at school in Freetown, so I was part of it. And that's when I met her first. And Sabella, um, you, I believe you are actually, King Charles is actually godfather to your son, so I presume you stayed close since university in the years following. Yes, relatively. I mean, he has been a brilliant godfather. 
he has many godchildren now. Uh, when he became godfather to James, he, he only had a very few because we were just in our early 20s and um, he was starting out, both of us were from university, and he was indeed a close friend and has been the most loyal and constant uh, godfather and there for James at times of difficulty, job loss and that kind of thing, always very hands-on. And knowing the man, what type of king do you expect him to be? That's a huge question. I think he'll be faithful, loyal, dedicated. I think the words that he used in his address echoed the Queen's earlier pledge when she was 21, that speech that we all know so well. And he, in a way, followed that pledge for the years that are remaining to him to be dedicated to serving this country and, and the Commonwealth and the other realms. And I think that's what he'll be like. I think he'll be totally dedicated to it with the same sense of duty that the Queen had, uh, which I think he's had all his life, as, as he once said when somebody asked him, what does it feel like to be the heir to the throne? He said in his wonderful way, well, I wouldn't really know because I've never been anything else. And I think that's given him an awareness of the commitment. So I think he'll be brilliant and different. <laughs> and already day-to-day -day duties have started, haven't they, for the new king? How do you think yes. he has reacted in the last couple of days in terms of what we've seen and the moments that we've seen him with the crowds here and also when he addressed the nation? Yes, uh, I mean, I think it's been absolutely amazing and couldn't possibly have been done any different or better, I mean. And I, I think it must have been so hard when you're trying to carry your own personal grief and bereavement and losing his parents close together as, as I did. And so I think I know a little bit about what that feels. And it's a huge sadness, but, you know, he has to obviously um, contain that and, and do what is right for now. And I think the mix of informality, that greeting the crowd, talking so personally in his wonderful address, um, means that he's already got going and I think he will carry on day to day and he will um, somehow get through the next week, which of course will also be marvellous and celebratory because she was 96 and she's gone home to heaven. As a friend said, she was at work in Balmoral on Tuesday and resting in heaven on Thursday. And Sibella, I know you will be holding a church service today. How will that be remembering the Queen? Um, yes, I'm a licensed lay minister here. It's um, in the context of our normal morning worship on Sunday, non-Eucharistic service, and I will be talking about her life and the Gospel uh, is from Gospel of John chapter 6, which is about um, Jesus never, never, never letting you go. So there'll be prayers and hymns, and I hope um, people from the village to come and remember her. Candles to light. Sibella Lang, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you this morning. Thank you so much for joining us here on BBC Breakfast. Thank you, Sam. It is just coming up to eight o'clock. Let's see how the weather is looking. Stav has the forecast. Thank you. Good morning to you. Well, it looks like part two of the weekend will be drier and sunnier than yesterday. I feel quite warm into the afternoon as well, but we have a new area of low pressure which will work into western areas later on, bringing some rain, particularly to Northern Ireland. And you can see it showing up clearly here on the pressure chart. High pressure, though, holds on across much of the country, bringing fine and settled conditions throughout the day. But it will be quite a chilly start across Scotland, England, Wales. Some mist and fog patches around first thing, which could be quite dense for a while. They'll tend to lift and break. And then we should see plenty of sunshine in the afternoon, but a fair weather cloud bubbling up, and that might herald an isolated light shower. For Northern Ireland, though, it will be turning much wetter into the afternoon and the winds will be picking up from the south. However, I think it's going to be a slightly warmer day today. We're up to 21 degrees in Inverness, up to 23 degrees across the south and east of England. But some of this rain across Northern Ireland will be heavy and thundering. It'll continue to push its way northwards and eastwards overnight into much of Scotland, 
northern England and northern and western Wales. Some rumbles of thunder even further south. Behind it, something a little bit fresher, just pushing to the northwest of Scotland. Otherwise, it's a mild and muggy night for all areas, particularly warm across the south. So for Monday then, we'll have that weather front line through central areas, being a rather grey, damp day here, very slowly sinking southwards. But for much of southern Britain, dry, sunny and very warm, maybe an odd shower here. Bright for Scotland, Northern Ireland, but we will see some blustery showers across the north and west of Scotland. Temperatures will be coming down here. So the uh, mid to high teens in the north, up to the mid 20s across the south and east. And then into Tuesday, well, it looks like we're all into that fresher air. That weather front would have spread southwards. Uh, should see quite a bit of sunshine around, though, thanks to high pressure trying to build in. it would be noticeably cool in the north and across the south. Highs of 21 or 22 degrees. So it does look like this area of high pressure will continue to establish itself to the west of the UK as we move deeper on into the week. Low pressure over Scandinavia, that will open the floodgates to a northerly wind for a while. And that will bring down some colder air, which will be noticeable across all areas by the end of the week, but most noticeably across the northern half of the country. But because higher pressure wants to influence our weather throughout the week, once we lose the rain early in the week, it will turn dry with some sunshine, but it'll be noticeably cooler by day and by night. That's it. I'll see you later. Hello there. Good morning. Welcome to Breakfast with me, John Kay, this morning at the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh and Sally Nugent at Buckingham Palace in London. Here are our headlines this morning. The first stage of the Queen's final journey begins today as her coffin is driven from Balmoral on a six-hour journey to Edinburgh before being flown to London on Tuesday. The Queen is due to lie in state for four days here in the capital before a state funeral at Westminster Abbey on Monday the 19th of September. Members of the royal family have thanked mourners who have gathered to remember the Queen, including an unexpected show of unity from Princes William and Harry. Hello there, good morning. Sunday morning, the 11th of September. And it's a uh, slightly chilly, but very calm morning here in Edinburgh. People just waking up, we've heard church bells ringing and we're at the gates of the Palace of Holyrood House here in the centre of Edinburgh at the end of the Royal Mile. This the official residence of the British monarch in Scotland. And today the Queen's coffin will arrive here from her beloved Balmoral estate and we are expecting thousands of people to line the roads here and all along the route. So let's just have a look at the route it will take today. At around 10 o'clock this morning, her coffin will be carried by six of the gamekeepers from her Scottish estate at Balmoral, from the ballroom there, to a waiting hearse. From there, it will begin a six-hour journey of 175 miles, and that route is going to pass through Aberdeen and then on to Dundee, before finally arriving here at the palace in Edinburgh at about four o'clock this afternoon. Now the coffin will be taken to the throne room and will remain there until tomorrow afternoon, Monday afternoon, when there will be another procession from the palace to St Giles's Cathedral uh, along the Royal Mile, just uh, a few moments walk away. Well, our correspondent Judith Moritz has spent the last day and night uh, just on the street around this spot, speaking to some of the people who are involved in the ceremonial activities of the next couple of days. The eyes of the world are about to turn to Edinburgh. And step by step, beat by beat, the pageantry must be perfect. In this city, no one wants to put a foot wrong. This was yesterday's dress rehearsal. Today will be the real thing. Those with ceremonial responsibilities are feeling a mixture of pressure and pride. It's a huge responsibility. I have been the Lord Provost and the Lord Lieutenant for just a few weeks, and I just hope I live up to the expectations 
of me and I hope and I'm sure that the city will put on a, a very determined show of its respect for the Queen in the next few days. Yesterday, the public proclamation of the new king at St James's Palace in London began a series of historic ceremonies. Three cheers for His Majesty the King! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! But as well as the formal events, there were also moments for family. At Windsor, William and Catherine, together with Harry and Meghan, came to meet well-wishers and share memories of their grandmother, the Queen. And at Balmoral, Princes Andrew and Edward, Princess Anne, their spouses and children, read some of the many tributes, which prompted obvious emotions and a tender moment as Princess Eugenie held on to her father for comfort. Today, the focus will move from the monarch's summer residence to the Scottish capital. Because the Queen died at Balmoral, it set in train a whole sequence of events in Scotland that wouldn't have happened had she passed away in London. And so its capital city is readying itself as the Queen's coffin is brought here and Edinburgh becomes the centre of events for the next few days. On Monday, the King will join the procession as the coffin is brought along the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral, where the Queen will lie at rest. Anybody can talk about faith, but to live it is what makes a difference to people. And I think she lived it, and she lived it in the week. Reverend Liz Henderson is one of the royal chaplains and is preparing for the service of prayer and reflection to be held at the cathedral. When you look around Edinburgh, you can see that building, can't you? The, the place is getting busier and busier, and there are more and people gathering, and they are particularly in this part of the old town. And so the focus is very much on St Giles. It has particular significance um, for this service because the Queen actually came here just three weeks after her coronation in June 1953. And it was here that she was blessed by the then moderator of the Church of Scotland and the Dean of the Chapel Royal. As flowers continue to arrive, News crews keep coming too. Demain matin à 11h heure française, le château de Balmoral pour rejoindre le palais d'Hollywood. Here, from all over the globe. French people are fascinated by the royal family, by all the stories. Uh, they don't want monarchy in France, but uh, they are very attached by the royal family. When we learned uh, when we were on set in Paris that something uh, was about to happen, we were all very sad. We were all very sad. I come from Italy, from Rome, and the minute we heard the news that the Queen was sick, we just flew to Great Britain and then we moved to Balmoral because it's of a huge impact in Italy as well. We, we're very interested into British monarchy. Yesterday we had half an hour of, um, dedicated to this, uh, to this event and we're going to keep, keep going on for the next few days until the official funeral. Amongst the pomp and protocol, there are the people. Once the Queen's subjects, now the King's all witnessing history as it happens around them. Judith Moritz, BBC News, Edinburgh. Well, here at the gates of the Palace of Holyrood House, I don't know whether you can hear. I'll just be quiet for a second. Some of the buglers from the royal household, I think, practicing, rehearsing uh, the last post there, as they've been rehearsing all night, because this will become the very focus, the world's focus over the next couple of days. Uh, we know that uh, the Palace of Holyrood House, this is uh, the Queen's, is the monarch's official residence here in Scotland. She was only here. Uh, in June, July for what she called Holyrood Week where she would host garden parties here at the end of the Royal Mile, would carry out investitures and today she will be brought back 
here uh, with the public attending all the way from Balmoral uh, witnessing that moment. Uh, tomorrow the coffin will be taken to the Cathedral of St Giles on the Royal Mile where she will lie at rest and again there will be a private service there for family and friends and the members of the public will be able to to process in and pay their own personal respect and all night under the cover of darkness we have seen rehearsals taking place for what is about to happen and I think it's only really when we see these pictures we kind of come to terms with what we're about to see for real over the next couple of days. We will see these processions, the military making sure that every footstep is perfect, every moment of the plans that the Queen was part of and was well aware of what would happen if she were to pass away in Scotland. She knew the plan was to bring the coffin here to Edinburgh and then to the Cathedral of St Giles. And the military that we've spoken to, the people we've met in the streets have told us they just want to get every footstep of that right. Well, our Royal Correspondent Sarah Campbell is at Balmoral Castle for us this morning where the Queen begins that final journey from her beloved Balmoral. And Sarah, it was a place that meant so much to her and still is providing peace and tranquility and sanctuary for the rest of her family while they grieve. Yes, indeed. Good morning, John. It is a beautiful morning again here in this corner of the Scottish Highlands. The sun has come up, shining down over the castle, shining down over the gates behind preparations, last minute preparations going on uh, for, as you say, the journey of the Queen's Coffin, which is due to begin here at 10 o'clock this morning. And since her death on Thursday, she passed away here on Thursday, members of her family have been arriving, spending time behind those castle gates. But yesterday, they did come out. Princess Anne and her family, Prince Andrew and his two daughters, Beatrice and Eugenie, and the Earl and Countess of Wessex and their daughter, Lady Louise. And they travelled to Crathy Kirk, which is the church uh, just a few minutes from here. There was a short private family service. And on the way back, they stopped the cars got out of the cars and, and walked down here and met with some of the hundreds, thousands of people who've made the journey here to Balmoral uh, to lay their own tributes. And the family spoke to them, said thank you to them for coming, and then looked and spent some time with the floral tributes, reading those messages uh, that had been left from people here in the community and further afield. And then they left and they turned around and they gave a final wave to the crowd before they headed back into Balmoral Castle. And as we've been saying, the journey begins here today at 10 o'clock. Since Thursday, the Queen has been in an oak coffin in the ballroom here at Balmoral Castle, covered with a royal standard for Scotland and a wreath of flowers. The time there has allowed members of her family to pay tribute to her, pay their respects, but also so many members of staff who've so loyally served her for so many years. And at 10 o'clock, six gamekeepers will carry the coffin to the waiting hearse. It will leave through those gates and it will start that long journey to Edinburgh, 175 miles. It will travel through the cities of Aberdeen, through Dundee, through Perth, travelling slowly. The whole journey is due to take six hours, the aim being to allow as many people as possible to come out, to see it as it passes, and to pay their own respects to the passing Queen. Sarah Campbell at Balmoral, thank you very much indeed. We'll return to Sarah a little bit later, and we'll also talk you through uh, the different stages of that journey, that 175 mile, six hour journey uh, that begins at 10 o'clock this morning from Balmoral, where, where Sarah was. 
Uh, the coffin due to arrive here at the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh at about four o'clock this afternoon. And uh, the authorities here have told us here on breakfast in the last half hour that they're expecting tens and tens of thousands of people to descend on the Royal Mile uh, and to wait here at the Palace uh, to pay their respects today and again tomorrow. This is a city which really is feeling like it's at the centre of history right now and which is going to be the focus of the world's attention over the next couple of days before the coffin goes to London. And of course then the focus will be on Westminster Hall and Buckingham Palace and Sally is there for us this morning. Hello Sal. John, thank you very much indeed and talking to people here this morning here at Buckingham Palace there is a real sense here John that perhaps this doesn't feel real just yet but of course today is the day when we imagine this will all change as you mentioned when the Queen's final journey starts and here at the palace thousands of people have travelled this weekend to honour the UK's longest serving monarch there you can see that shot of the mile the mist is lifting slightly over Buckingham Palace in the last half hour or so very chilly down here this morning and there have been so many floral tributes there have been candles there have been children's drawings when we arrived here it was very dark this morning about half past four five o'clock there were candles all along the front of Buckingham Palace still lit people just moving among them just having a look and seeing what the messages said. Um, the flowers that have been left here are being moved to a nearby park and all gathered together there. Tim Moffat has been speaking to people about how the death of the Queen has affected them. Step by step, we are all readjusting to life in a new era. just a very strange, solemn time, losing someone that's been there all of your life. Southwark Cathedral in London. Rarely has queuing, that mundane, archetypal British activity, felt so poignant. Books are being filled with messages of condolence. The Queen's been our Queen for all our lives, and uh, I think now, we have a king, and it's likely to be kings for all the rest of our lives, but our children's lives as well. It's momentous. Can I ask you, what, what did you decide to put? Um, I put the stories and what you did for our nation will never leave us. And I think that's what's really come, come across, is the fact that we, we didn't really know what she meant and what she did until she's not there. Football matches have been called off this weekend, and on the Thames, so too was the Great River Race, typically competitive and gruelling. Instead, the more than 300 participants were invited to be part of the Queen Elizabeth II Memorial River Procession. As soon as the death of Queen Elizabeth was announced on Thursday, thousands of bouquets of flowers were laid in front of Buckingham Palace. Now, in London, well-wishers are being asked instead to place them in Hyde Park or here in Green Park. Have you been surprised as to how you've reacted? Some people say... I that. was very surprised. Yes. And I don't know why, I felt very teary. Maybe as a mother of a daughter, she led with such dignity and I often try and teach my children humility and dignity. And she was a perfect example, so I think... Uh, that's why it's shaking me a bit. Audrey Stevenson was in the Royal Navy for almost 30 years and met the Queen several times. Um, I needed to come and pay my respects. And it's just really affected me deeply, the loss of the, uh, our Queen. Um, I served in the military for 27 years and uh, the day I joined the military was the day that I swore allegiance to the Queen um, and I, I joined up to serve her and I was proud to do so. When you, when you spoke to her, you didn't, you didn't feel nervous. You just felt this calmness come around you because she was just so graceful. I feel like I've lost my grandmother. I feel so humbled by how the whole country has reacted, the nation, the world, everybody. Um, and we just felt it was the right thing to do, just to come down, pay our respects. 
it has brought uh, memories to my mum as well. Uh, she's passed away and it just brought a lot of memories and just remembrance of it because my mum adored the Queen. We were blessed to have her. This national period of reflection has for many led to unexpected emotions, feelings and memories. The impact of Queen Elizabeth II's extraordinary life continues to be felt. Tim Muffet, BBC News. Some of the floral tributes are absolutely stunning, I can tell you. And across the parks here, there will be many more arriving, I know, over the coming days. Well, our diplomatic correspondent Paul Adams is at Clarence House for us this morning, where the new king is preparing for events here at Buckingham Palace. Morning to you, Paul. And what is on the agenda for the new king today? Yeah, good morning, Sally. Steady stream of people coming by our position, just a few hundred yards from where you are. I suspect not many of them perhaps even realise that this is Clarence House, where Prince Charles, as was, uh, has had, had his, has his, his official residence for some time. We don't actually know when he's going to move from here permanently to Buckingham Palace, uh, but he will be going there today to the office, if you like, uh, to continue the business of establishing himself as the new monarch. Yesterday, he got to meet members of the government. Today, it's all about the 56 members of the Commonwealth. Uh, he will be holding a meeting with the Commonwealth Secretary General, Baroness Scotland, and after that, a reception with the 14 representatives of countries that still have the monarch as their head of state, countries like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Jamaica and others. Uh, King Charles has spoken a lot about his commitment to the Commonwealth uh, to continue uh, part of his mother's important legacy. And of course, there will be challenges ahead as uh, members of the Commonwealth consider their relationship both with the Crown and with the United Kingdom. Only last year we saw Barbados, for example, declaring itself a republic. Prince Charles was there to recognise and acknowledge the moment. And as king, he is likely to face similar moments in the future. But for today, it's all about saying to those representatives that he is determined to continue to fulfil the legacy of his mother and to continue to head the Commonwealth as fervently and as successfully as she did. Paul, thanks very much indeed. Well, meanwhile, India is observing a national day of mourning today in memory of Queen Elizabeth II. Our South Asia correspondent, Yogita Lamai, is in Delhi for us this morning. Yogita, how are people there paying tribute to Her Majesty? Well, so behind me, you can see the Indian flag there, which is flying at half mast. And that's what's happening across the country today on this National Day of Mourning. No official entertainment events will be held either. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has described the Queen as a stalwart of our times. Uh, he said that she personified dignity and decency in public life. Opposition leader Sonia Gandhi has said she was a much-loved figure and someone who was a symbol of constancy and continuity. Uh, but the British, family, uh, the British royal family's relationship with India was a complicated one because of the nature of colonial rule. So you have had people here asking today why the government is choosing to honour what they see as a symbol of colonial rule. Uh, but I, I've been speaking to a lot of people, particularly those who were born, the first generation born after independence and the two words I think I've heard most frequently used are dignity and decency and one historian who I was speaking to who I asked about this sort of complicated and evolving relationship that India has had with the UK with the British royal family uh, and the thing she said to me was that you can condole the death of a queen you can participate in the grief of that without condoning the suffering that was caused by colonialism. So you're seeing, you know, a lot of that here today, mixed reactions. You're not really seeing an outpouring of grief here the way you've seen in other parts of the Commonwealth, but that's perhaps because, you know, the British monarch didn't continue to be uh, the head of state here as it did in some other parts of the Commonwealth. Yogita, thank you very much indeed. That's Yogita Lamai reporting for us from Delhi this morning. Well, the world of sport has also been paying tribute to the Queen, with some events scheduled for this weekend postponed. In horse racing, the Queen's favourite sport, Saturday's yesterday St Ledger race, was cancelled and will instead take place today. Well, 
the Great North Run is another of the sporting events that will go ahead today, although organisers have said it will be taking place in a more subdued form. Alison Freeman is in Newcastle for us. Morning, Alison. Good morning, Sally. Yes, this is going to be the 41st Great North Run. And as you say, it's going to take place, but there's going to be a very different atmosphere here. And I can tell you from having been here for many years before that it is feeling a lot quieter, a lot gentler today. Um, this is the first time in about three years um, due to the pandemic that it's actually got back on its normal route, travelling from the central motorway here in the middle of Newcastle across the Tyne Bridge to South Shields. It was cancelled in 2020 because of the pandemic and last year it took a very different route. But this year, as I say, it's back on but with a very different mood and it was felt it should go ahead by the organisers because the amount of money that's going to be raised around £25 million by the runners um, and they felt that reflected the service that the Queen has given to the nation. Now some of the differences that there are going to be is there's going to be a service, a short service by faith leaders at the beginning of the run and I'm joined by a couple of those leaders now. First off I'm joined by uh, Mark Rowe who's the Bishop of Newcastle, and the act sorry the acting Bishop of Newcastle right. and the Bishop of Berwick. Mark just tell me why do you think it's important that the Great North Run does take place today? I think it's important for, for various reasons, but one is it's a, it's a huge community event. It's a huge part of the North East and, and all the people coming to run here today all have their individual stories. They're already running for a really good cause or very often in memory of someone that they, uh, they, they've, they've lost and they want to uh, respect and pay tribute to and, and raise funds for. So it seems entirely appropriate that we take all of the, the emotion, all the feeling and all of the loss that we share as a nation uh, and use this opportunity to pay our tribute to someone who has served our nation so extraordinarily for so many years. So it seems entirely right that the run goes ahead. But we do it in that spirit of wanting to pay tribute to Her Majesty and to her life and her service and show something of our devotion and respect for her and for what she means to so many of us. You touched on there, people running in memory of loved ones. I know that there's been a sense this week, hasn't there, that, that people aren't just grieving the Queen, but it's reminded them perhaps of loss that they've experienced in their own lives as well. I think, I think that's right. I think in so many ways the Queen has touched people really deeply uh, and that's just brought to, sur to the surface a lot of our own uh, feelings of, of loss, particularly in the last two years. Uh, all the things that we've been uh, feeling as a nation uh, and actually today is a, is a wonderful opportunity for people to come together to share that, that sense of loss, to share something of what the Queen has meant, but also to share those individual stories, our own losses, our own uh, situations in our own lives where we are feeling uh, a, a grief uh, a, and a bit, a bit forlorn really, and, but being able to, able to come together as a community to share that and to, and to run together I think is a brilliant, uh, brilliant thing that we're doing today. Lovely words there. Thank you so much, Bishop. Um, moving now on to Harry, you're a, a community leader, aren't you, here in Newcastle? And you've met the Queen on several occasions, haven't you? I have met three times, you know, and uh, every time I met, you know, I can never forget. You know, she was so very much interested in what I was saying, and she cared for every everyone, human being. And uh, she actually, for 70 years, served this nation commonwealth and the world and the people today outside look at Britain and they actually say that if people in Britain can live together in unity and peace why can't we and so we've been example you know set an example to many many countries and the people that here we actually live with dignity and respect and that is what she cared for and she actually wanted to make sure that every every person is respective of his, uh, uh, her background, or faith, or tradition, uh, plays an important part in the life of the community here. And we have, been, we have been told in many, many ways that you have a responsibility, you can contribute, so that every person has something to contribute to the well-being of our society here. And she actually taught us the concern for common humanity that we care for people. We never say which country you are from. You are a friend and friend of this country. Let's all work together and look at round and there are needs which have to be met and we can all do something to meet those needs. And she was actually a symbol of unity and peace. And we believe in that my main interest was unity because you know for 48 years I've been working in this area uh, to develop good resolutions and so that people actually uh, feel, live with dignity and respect. 
and play their rightful role in the life of the community. And so I follow, I, I used to follow her footsteps every day and I will never forget that. Thank you so much. Such lovely words, Harry. Thank you so much. So um, the Bishop and Harry are going to be standing shoulder to shoulder at the start line at around half past ten uh, to address the runners. Um, back to you, Sally. Alison, thanks very much indeed. And good luck to everybody taking part today. It is 28 minutes past eight. Let's see how the weather is looking. Stav has the forecast. Thank you. Good morning to you. Well, it's looking like being a drier part two of the weekend with more sunshine around today with high pressure continuing to dominate. But there will be some rain pushing into western areas later on. All could see this new area of low pressure. Some of the rain will be quite heavy for a time across Northern Ireland into this evening. But high pressure holds on across much of the country. Light winds, quite a chilly start today, some early mist and fog, which will tend to lift and break. And then we should see quite a bit of sunshine around, just a slim chance of an isolated light shower. Further west, though, it starts to turn cloudier, breezier, much wetter, certainly for Northern Ireland. Temperatures up to around 21 degrees, though, northern Scotland with the sunshine, up to 23 degrees across the southeast. But it turns very much wet across Northern Ireland, then into Scotland, Northern England, Northern and Western Wales this evening and overnight. Could have some rumbles of thunder with that rain, and behind it, some blustery showers pushing to the far northwest of Scotland, but dry and quite mild and muggy across the south. So for Monday then, we have a three-way split. Central areas will see that weather front rather damp with outbreaks of rain. To the north of it, it's cooler sunshine and some blustery showers in the northwest of Scotland. But southern Britain will be drier with some sunshine and feeling quite warm up to 25 degrees there. Maybe a not heavy shower but fresher in the north. That fresher air in the north does spread southwards uh, as we move into Tuesday, maybe a few showers on it. And then high pressure builds into the west, so it'll be largely settled to the latter part of the week, but it will be turning cooler. Hello there. Good morning. You're watching Breakfast on the BBC, and welcome back to the Palace of Holyrood House here in Edinburgh. We're here because this is where the Queen's coffin will arrive later today, ahead of a week of events leading up to her funeral and uh, as I speak uh, more of the security guards, the police, the military are turning up here at the gates of the palace uh, to play their part in this two days of history that will take place in Edinburgh and of course thousands and thousands of members of the public are also heading this way they're going to be watching it for themselves uh, wanting to, to see what happens so we thought we'd just talk you through now that the details of what you can expect over the next couple of days. So it starts at about 10 o'clock this morning. That is when the Queen's coffin will be carried by six of her gamekeepers at Balmoral to a hearse that is waiting. And it will then make a six hour journey, 175 miles uh, through Aberdeen and Dundee to Edinburgh be brought here to the throne room at the Palace of Holyrood House and will wait here overnight at rest. Then tomorrow, Monday, the new king and members of the royal family will accompany the coffin in procession to St Giles's Cathedral along the Royal Mile here in Edinburgh. It's a, a short procession walk, it will take about 10-15 minutes. And the Queen will lie at rest inside the cathedral then for 24 hours, during which time members of the public will be allowed inside to view her coffin and pay their respects. The following day, Tuesday, the coffin will be flown back from Edinburgh to London, accompanied by the Queen's daughter, Princess Anne, and then the Queen's body will return to Buckingham Palace. On Wednesday, it will then travel just over a mile from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall at the Houses of Parliament, where the late monarch will lie in state for four days and that's where thousands of people more are expected to pay their respects. And then on Monday, a week tomorrow, the coffin will make the journey from Westminster Hall to Westminster Abbey ahead of the Queen's state funeral which will take place at 11 o'clock next Monday, a week tomorrow, a day that has been declared a bank holiday by the new King. And the final journey that afternoon will then be on to St George's Chapel in Windsor Castle, where her coffin will be interred within the Royal Vault. The journey today begins at Balmoral, the Queen's beloved estate, and our Royal Correspondent Sarah Campbell is there for us this morning. 
And Sarah, we were saying earlier, weren't we, that it's, it's at those gates when we see the hearse leaving that I think for many of us, the reality of what's happened very quickly over the last couple of days will, will finally become clear. Yes, good morning to you again, John. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Even though we've been talking about it for days now, it still somehow doesn't seem real. But as you say, in just less than a couple of hours, it, it will become real because that image will be there. And as you can see, sort of police lining up, making the final preparations, getting everything in place. Uh, press photographers have been arriving all morning to make sure they're in the position to get that first image, historic image really of the Queen leaving Balmoral for the very last time and as we've said this is a place that she loved. She spent so many months here across so many years uh, throughout her life since she was a child she used to come here and so many memories were made here and when one thinks of her time in Balmoral some of the images which come to mind of her are, are of her attending the Braemar Highland Gathering, always held at the beginning of September, and it really sort of was the, the big public event. It was an absolute fixture in her calendar, and I'm very pleased to say that the former secretary of the gathering, William Meston, is here uh, this morning. Um, it really was an event that she rarely missed, wasn't it? I think about three times during the time I was secretary, she didn't manage to attend for various reasons and certainly seemed to look forward to coming to the gathering. Well, certainly the photographs seem to suggest that she uh, enjoyed it, always laughing and very always participating. I mean, what, what was she like when she was there? She was very relaxed. And she was very, very relaxed, watching all the events, basically taking everything in and uh, particularly enjoyed the Cadiz sack races and things like that. The royal family always rolled about with laughter and when they happened, excellent. Um, it was, of course, the Bremer gathering was last weekend, last Saturday, and the Queen didn't attend. Um, Prince Charles, as he was then, now King Charles, attended uh, on her behalf. And that was really the first indication, I think, to people here that something wasn't right very telling factor. I mean, everybody was looking forward to see Her Majesty back at the gathering. Unfortunately, it couldn't have happened this year. And that was a signal that things weren't maybe as well as they might have been. Yeah. Um, we've been talking for the last few days about the fact that the Queen obviously loved it here. And it was felt that she was very much a member of the community, that you would see her out and about. She would talk and, 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 and people really felt that she was one of their own. She was uh, very, very much part of the community, very interested in the community. Uh, the community very protective towards the members of the royal family, uh, wouldn't divulge where they were or what they were doing. You know, it was a genuine family feeling about it. We almost felt proud to be part of the family, so to speak. And so how are you feeling today? Very sad. It's been a very I don't know, emotional, flat few days. You know, it, it, although you see it over the years with her great age, it might have been expected, but it, you're never ready for something like that, but it does happen. Um, and how's the community feeling? Is there a feeling that you've lost one of your own? Very much so. Very stoic. Um, I look forward, we certainly will miss Her Majesty fantastically, you know. Now I know you aren't going to be here when the coffin leaves, but you are going home and you will watch the coffin as it passes, as it makes this long journey to Edinburgh. Yeah, the family are coming to the house to see the cortege passing. Yeah, we feel it's appropriate place to be at that time. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. I think the sense there, I think there really is a sense here that many people have lost a part of the community, there's a real personal sense of loss and, and many people certainly here and probably along that route, that 175 miles, that six hour journey, so many people will be coming out and just wanting to pay their respects to the Queen. John. Yes, yeah, Sarah, lovely to hear those memories uh, and get a sense of, of the feeling at Balmoral. Uh, that journey, the Queen's final journey from uh, her beloved Balmoral begins in just over an hour uh, at 10 o'clock and there'll be full coverage of that journey, six hours by road uh, to Edinburgh on the BBC News over the course of the day. And so over the next two days the focus will become then 
on Edinburgh, the ceremony here in Edinburgh, Edinburgh paying its respect in an official way. And we're joined now uh, outside the gates of the palace here by John Swinney, who's the Deputy First Minister of Scotland, and Councillor Robert Aldridge, who's also the Lord Provost and Lord Lieutenant of Edinburgh. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Uh, Robert, you were just showing me your, your chains and, and pointed out that you've had to cover up the jewel. Just, just to explain. Yes, the, uh, there's a rather magnificent medal at the foot of the chain here with many diamonds on it. But during the mourning period, as a, a matter of respect to Her Majesty, we keep it covered with a, a black pouch the entire mourning period. You're going to be playing an important role here over the next couple of days, Robert. Just, just explain what, what your part will be. Well, as Lord Lieutenant, it's my role to uh, greet uh, His Majesty the King when he arrives here uh, tomorrow. Uh, I participate in the ceremony of the keys. It's an ancient uh, ceremony where we offer the keys of the city to the sovereign uh, in the hope that the sovereign will then hand them back to us. Uh, every year so far that has happened. I hope I'm not going to be the first Lord Provost to be refused. Um, and uh, there are a number of other very important aspects uh, linked to the memorial church service and, and so on, and of course paying our respects as uh, uh, Her Majesty's funeral cortege goes down the Royal Mile uh, this afternoon. Yeah. John, the Queen was only here for what she calls Holyrood Week, uh, living at the palace here uh, late June, early July this year. How did she seem then? I think the, the, the Queen was incredibly strong when she was here in late June, early July. She had a full week of engagements. Uh, the Queen did a, a phenomenal amount of activity, as she always does mm -hmm. when she comes on Hollywood Week. She was slightly more restricted where she went. She would normally be out and about around the country visiting different communities, as she did so faithfully over the 70 years of her reign. But she was very strong and she, uh, she visibly loved being in Hollywood, as she always did. And she engaged very strongly in that in that program and it's so important to so many people in edinburgh but right across scotland that they can pay their respects can, can be part of this it means an awful lot to people we've been working very closely with local authorities around the country particularly with the city council here in the city of edinburgh to make sure that members of the public have the opportunity to pay their respects to her majesty the queen to be able to do that in a safe manner and a respectful manner and there's been a huge amount of work done around the country to make sure that all of the planning is in place at Balmoral, in Ballater, in Aberdeen, Dundee and here in the city of Edinburgh to make sure that as many people as possible can be involved in paying their respects to Her Majesty uh, over the course of today as the cortege comes through the country but then specifically in Edinburgh on Monday and Tuesday when Edinburgh will be very much the centre of the, 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 the tributes, but it was also the centre of much of the outlook of Her Majesty, who, who loved this city and who loved being here. Yeah. What would your advice be, John, to people who are watching this morning, waking up, realising the route that we just talked through and think, I, I, I want to witness this, I want to pay my respects. You're talking about coping and, and, and numbers on the roads and, and, and here in Edinburgh itself. What, what would the recommendation be about what to do and where to go? My, my plea to people would be to follow all of the transport advice that's available through Traffic Scotland and through the local authority partners that we're working with around the country. There will be a lot of people wanting to, to view the cortege, there'll be lots of people wanting to pay their respects and I just ask people to, to be patient, to act in a safe fashion, to follow the instructions of the police and the stewards. There's hundreds and hundreds of stewards around the country but to make sure that uh, people uh, operate in a safe fashion and just follow the advice that's available. Robert, here in Edinburgh, how, how would you describe the, the sense, the feeling on the streets? You've been walking around, you've been involved in these rehearsals. It's, it's a, a strange mixture, I think, of uh, intense sadness at the passing of Her Majesty. Uh, the city's a little subdued, but also incredibly proud that we're going to be at the centre of a historical moment and I think a determination to make sure that we put on the best display we possibly can as the capital city is some kind of uh, uh, payback to the Queen for the immense service she has given to the country but also the love she's had for this city. It's astonishing how quickly all of this has happened over the last few days, isn't it? And I, I was amazed when I got here at just how quickly 
Edinburgh had been prepared for this. You know, the gantries have been built for cameras, the security's in place. Everything is, is set for this moment, prepared. Well, obviously there had been some discussions in advance mm -hmm. uh, uh, about what could happen, but I have to pay tribute to uh, members of the council staff, the services and so on, all, uh, all around the city and, and beyond, who have put in an incredible shift of work over the last uh, few days. Getting the, the cities looking magnificent this morning uh, and uh, they've done a superb job, partly because of their pride in what the Queen meant to them. The Queen in their hearts, John, so many people have said as well, refer to the fact that the, the Queen often spoke about Scotland's place in, in her heart and in her family's life. The Queen always demonstrated a deep love and affection for Scotland, for many parts of Scotland. I think especially for Balmoral. She was quite clearly at her greatest moments of peace in Balmoral and that is, you know, will be reflected in the, the, the journey that she makes today when she, she leaves Balmoral for the very last time. And I think around the country people will want to remember and recollect that deep love of Scotland. When the Queen came to address the Scottish Parliament, which she did at every session of the Parliament since it was established, which she opened in 1999. She's always talked about her deep love and affection for Scotland, and that was reciprocated by people whose lives were touched by their involvement with the Queen and her engagement within their own lives and their own communities. And whether the Queen was leaving Balmoral to go to a state occasion or leaving Balmoral to go to the shops in Ballater. Uh, she never seemed more at peace than it, in, in Scotland and in Balmoral, and that will be reflected today. Thank you both so much for joining us here on BBC Breakfast this morning. The sun's coming out as we stand here, isn't it? It's going to be a, a beautiful, clear, crisp, sunny autumn day in Edinburgh by the looks of it, and uh, it'll make this city look even more magnificent for uh, an extraordinary moment. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you talking there about the, the peace and tranquility that the, the Queen loved at uh, Balmoral. Of course, her family, uh, remaining members of her family, are, are there on the estate now as well, where they've been grieving, but allowed to grieve in that peace and tranquility and make the most of it before they head back to London uh, and to Buckingham Palace. Sally is at Buckingham Palace for us this morning, where thousands of people are still turning up, even on a Sunday morning, Sal. Well, you know, John, that's the, an interesting point you make. I wonder whether, because it's a Sunday morning, we might see even more people here today. And one remarkable thing, I know there's been lots of children, grandchildren, lots of families coming to Buckingham Palace. There are even more here today, and it is only a quarter to nine. I think many people expecting the crowds just to get bigger and bigger, so perhaps coming here early for their moment outside the gates of Buckingham Palace. And the configuration of the security barriers has all been changed, I think, clearly because they are expecting so many people here today. And isn't that a beautiful shot? Just look at that image there. The mist has lifted. If you've been watching for the last couple of hours, you'll know it's been terrifically misty here across the Mall. And you couldn't see the palace at the end of it at one point. And now, really, rather beautifully, the mist has lifted and Buckingham Palace is clearly in view behind us. So many people have been here sharing their memories of the Queen and what she meant to them. There have been so many incredible stories and John Maguire has been meeting some of them. John, you've met some incredible people, lots of families too. Yeah, very much so. Lots of families, certainly over the last couple of days, Sally. Different on Friday, of course, because it was a work day. Children would have been at school. But it has been, I must say, a real privilege to talk to people, to hear their stories. Everybody's got a story, of course, about the Queen. Uh, some will have met her, but many just felt as if they knew her so well. Uh, you can see crowds really, really starting to build now. What's changed yesterday is that this road has been closed off, so people are able to spread out because it was getting very, very congested in the front of the gates and the railings of Buckingham Palace. People who've been laying floral tributes here have been asked to take them to Green Park, just behind me. Uh, I think you've seen some of the pictures of that this morning, a sea of tributes, flowers, notes, lots of Paddington books and small stuff, Paddington bears. That's become a real symbol of Her Majesty the Queen because of that wonderful sketch that we all enjoyed in the Platinum. We've gathered some more people together to talk to us this morning. As I say, everybody with their own reason for coming this morning. Say hello to Josh and his granddad, Jeff. Morning to you too. Good morning. Uh, Josh, why did you come along today? Uh, just pay respect, uh, respect, 
green really because obviously she's such a great, great woman to be on the throne for so long and it's quite sad that she's passed. And, and as a young man, you, you, you're aware of, of, of her, obviously, but, but of the length of her duty yeah. and her service and what she did. Yes, obviously been, uh, been on the throne for the long, longest time out of anyone. Yeah. Um, and really just stayed out, of the, stayed out of politics, being quite a noble fi figure, hasn't really had any controversies, like any other famous people, really, and just hasn't just been quite lo lo lovely for everything I've heard of her. Very good. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Grandad, oh, good to see you this morning. You're, 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 you brought this wreath along. Just tell us a little bit about this. Uh, I bought the wreath up uh, from uh, Shubri and Great Weight in British Legion. I didn't really know what to put on it, so we put sadly missed by all the children, parents and grandparents from Shubri Ness and Great Weight Win. Rest in peace. Well, I think it, it's, it's, it's simple but effective, isn't yeah, it? It, yeah, it? It's yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. heartfelt, and yeah, that's what yeah. we've seen a lot of. What did the Queen mean to you during your lifetime, Jeff? Oh, quite a lot, really. She's, she's a wonderful person, done lovely things for other people in the world, and, that, and uh, she's sad to be missed. Yeah. Thanks very much. Good to talk to you this morning. Uh, Anna, James, good morning to you, morning. children. For the fantastically named Horatio and Evie, who is very keen to contribute to the she discussion this morning, is, yes. isn't it? Um, you left early this morning, I think, to get here. We did. We left about 5.30. Um, we wanted the children to have the opportunity to come and say thank you to the Queen. And Horatio has been learning about it all at school and, oh. and was very keen. And we thought he might remember it. Um, yeah. I'm sure, we, five. I'm sure with photos and things he absolutely will and yeah. important to bring the children today you obviously felt? Um, I think it fixes a moment in time doesn't it you know we come down here um, it's, it's hugely emotional um, and I think it'll be memories for us all but collectively you can see sort of the outpouring of love for uh, Her Majesty and, uh, and also it's good to support the King as well in, uh, in, in this transitional period. Definitely, it's incredibly moving. Yeah, it has been over the last few days, Anna, hasn't mm. it? And, and people will have uh, uh, taken the news in, in different ways and people have said to me they've been surprised by some of the emotions they've been feeling. Yes, I know that I have um, been very emotional about it and, and so have all my friends and, and, you know, we've been quite tearful about it because mm. I think the Queen meant so much to all of us um, and that's testament to how committed and dedicated she was. Um, she was really wonderful. Well, it's yeah. a life well lived, isn't it? You know, yeah. we all knew this moment was coming, sadly. Um, but uh, when it does, it's a shock. Um, but you know, you only have to look back, and you know, all the documentary evidence that's been going on over the last few days is testament to you know what she achieved in an enormous lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. I think Evie's telling me to move on yeah. <laughs> Thank from you behind. So much. Great to Thank talk you. to you. Shall we introduce you to one of King Charles III's brand new <laughs> subjects, Michael? Good morning to morning. you, really good to see you here. And this is Annabel Faith. How old is she? Uh, she's six days old. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's been an emotional week. Hasn't it? I it bet. has indeed. Born right. under the Queen and then registered at nine o'clock Friday morning under King Charles III. So. And yeah. the registrar made that point to you? Made that point to us, yeah. It's nine o'clock and she's the first subject that she's registered. Yeah. Which was amazing. Yeah. yeah. And incredible to think that you know we've all known, of course, only one monarch. She, she will doubtless know more than one, but, yep. but perhaps not another queen. Ex exactly. That's what I was saying to her mother. Is this could be the last time we see a queen? And you know, I pledged my allegiance when I was in the Boy Scouts, and right. now, in, in the week that she's been born, she's born under the queen, and, and now is a subject of the king. So I thought it's a good moment to bring her down this morning and just get that photo that when she's older, yeah. she could she was a part of that history at just so. six days old. Yeah. Can we just see if we can have a little shot of her? Annabelle you, Faith. You can. She is just she's beautiful. usually fairly... Look at that. Look at that. You weren't so beautiful away. at 4 a.m. this morning, <laughs> were you? When you look like Winston Churchill. <laughs> yeah. All right. Annabelle Faith, yes. Thank you very much, Thank Michael. You very much, Great to yeah, see you this morning. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, wonderful to see so many people. As we've said, everybody's got a different story, haven't they? And really, really interesting to hear those stories. Multi-generational. I don't think, though, we're going to get much younger than Annabelle Faith, are we? Just six days old, one of King Charles III's brand new subjects. Totally oblivious, but very happy. Back to you, Sally. John, thank you very much indeed. She's not so happy now. <laughs> She's going away for a cuddle, I think, with her dad. Thanks, John. Up.
Uh, we are joined now by the royal biographer and broadcaster, Giles Brandreth. Morning to you, Giles. Morning. The sun is shining now. And it's lovely. Isn't that a real moment? It We've is had a misty a morning. Real moment. And just now, the sun comes out. And I'm thinking that today, of course, is 9 11, the 11th of September. Of course. The anniversary of the tragic events that prompted the Queen to first use the phrase that grief is the price we pay for love 21 years ago. And actually, wandering here to Buckingham Palace, with the crowds that are, are gathering. It was interesting to see that there is grief, there is love, there's a sense of wanting to be part of history. People are bringing their children and their grandchildren here to lay flowers, to say thank you, and to feel part of the national story. And I was thinking too, walking down here, how this is affecting so many people in so many different ways. Yesterday, we saw the royal family. It was wonderful to see William and Harry together with Catherine and Meghan, uh, and to see, of course, the new king and the, the other children up at Balmoral. But I also began to think about the people who have been close to the Queen, who we never see, people like her personal page, Paul Wybrew, and her personal assistant, uh, Angela Kelly, her dresser, um, so <laughs> integral to the Queen's life, uh, companions, friends, members of staff, but friends to the Queen, and how they must be feeling now, the void in, in their lives, the void in all our lives. Though for me, what has been extraordinary the last 24 hours has been to see how the, the seamless transition, it feels as if it is... It has been seamless. It has been seamless and it feels it's, as if it's worked. Uh, walking down here this morning, I said to somebody, what did you make of yesterday? And they said of the king, oh, Charles, every inch a king. And that did come over yesterday in the speech. And how much, how much of that do you think is a reflection of his mother's plans? Do you know, is his mother's hand on all of this? Well, of course. It, you know, when you've been the sovereign as she was for 70 years, uh, seven months, three days, you know, the shadow she casts will be a long one. Uh, he will be the king different in his own way, but it will reflect her. And the way this is all working out, of course, she had it in mind. She had everything in mind. I think the easy way we now completely accept Camilla as the Queen Consort. That was set out for us by the Queen at the time of the Jubilee, that that is what she wanted. So we accept it's what we want to, and it's going to help the new King immeasurably. So heartbreaking, but at the same time heartening. So we are just coming up to 8.56 on Sunday morning and for the next few hours, in fact the next couple of days, the focus is very much on Scotland and we know at 10 o'clock there will be a hugely significant moment at Balmoral. You mentioned the people who have been closest to the Queen and it's interesting isn't it that her gamekeepers will be a very significant part of that moment. They will be lining the route uh, and thousands of people are expected to turn up as the uh, the, the coffin travels from Balmoral to Edinburgh, where it will be, uh, people will be able to go and pay their last respects. And it is for people, uh, people feel this personally. People feel, well, millions met the Queen. Everybody <laughs> knew the Queen. It's, it's our lives, the story of our lives. And so people will be going to say goodbye, to say thank you, and I think to reflect on their own lives. You mentioned, uh... William and Harry, uh, Prince William and Prince Harry, we saw yesterday. Um, do you think the fact that we saw them together yesterday for the first time in a long time, is that the start of some type of road to reconciliation? Wouldn't that be wonderful if it was, you know? Uh, united in sorrow, the family coming together. But we are going to see changes, there's no doubt. As um, the King said on Friday, you know, loving um, Harry and Meghan as they begin to build their lives overseas. The focus will be on the Prince and Princess of Wales. Uh, I think you're going to hear probably Gordon Brown in Scotland talking to Laura Kunzberg in a few minutes about <coughs> the slimmed down monarchy. It will change, but it will change uh, from where we are now. The seamless handover has, has happened and uh, it's happened well. Sadness, of course, but after 96 years, what a legacy. Giles Brander, thank you so much for talking to us this morning. It's delightful to speak to you. Thank you very much indeed, Giles. Well, as I said, it's 8.58 exactly now.
That is it from us here at Buckingham Palace, but let's go to Scotland where the focus will remain in the coming days. To John at the Palace of Holyrood House. Where the sun is also shining today, Sally. I was just thinking about that little baby that uh, John Maguire was talking to the parents at the gates of Buckingham Palace. Six days old. And goodness me, how much has changed in those six days? We get a new Prime Minister, we lose Queen Elizabeth II, we get a new king. And in just over an hour, the Queen will begin her final journey from her beloved estate of Balmoral to Edinburgh, this city, 175 miles it is. It will be a long, slow journey by road through Aberdeen and Dundee. Thousands of people expected to line the route as the late monarch's body is driven to the palace of Holyrood House here in Edinburgh. Coverage throughout the day on the BBC.